Well, welcome. I think many people are looking for the right place. Um, I think got swapped. Yeah. Good morning, young lady. Good morning. How are you, Leslie? Oh, it's a bit difficult to find. Sorry. The problem is not totally clear, so sure. that's probably the reason why not so many people are here here because they're upstairs. Yeah, in room five. Uh, they're they're in the in the hall yeah. trying to get to Wi-Fi in the because the program is on. Is, you have to go to the Make sure there's room. not I any room for just four rooms? No, just one. There's time. also room six. No, no. Oh, there's a room for yeah, yeah. 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 you. Yeah. Yeah. Now with us. No, no. Yes. If the others come, I think that it's the same stuff. Sit next to me. Okay, okay, yeah. That makes it a little bit more cozy, right? Thanks so much, Anne, and I think that this panel this morning is one of the most important panels, I would say. It's about uh, hope, igniting hope, as you said, Anne. As we are living in very dark times, if you look about, you know, what's happening around the world, uh, geopolitics, of course, climate change, and uh, even uh, economic uh, disparity, we are 
might go into an economic crisis. So we need uh, positivity, we need hope. And uh, here today, I think you all come from all different directions. I see philosophers, um, I see artists, uh, I see people writing poems and, uh, and fiction, uh, and of course, business people. So I wish you a wonderful session this morning, and let's hope, let's hope for a better world, and uh, you will make it happen. Thank you. That was a wonderful, powerful night from you, Frank. Thank you so much. Uh, hope is humanity's, if you break it down, it's humanity's own personal equity. It's something that resides deep within each and every person because we are custodians for the next generation. But in our current times, there have been very, very difficult activities individually as well as collectively that's happening in the world, which is causing a lot of social issues. It is causing psychological issues individually with people facing those problems, as well as economic. So when we look at hope, we have to look at why is function of the collective breaking down? Is the individual becoming immune to the situations around us? which is leading to the collective reaction because what we carry inside us is the reflection of what is around us. And today we want to debate this subject, we want to uh, have people's different perspectives on this subject. And so I'd like to first begin with uh, taking in my first panelist on this very hopeful journey. <laughs> And then we will follow that up with a discussion on a few questions. And the audience, please feel free to jump in when you want. State your name and then uh, your point of view on that subject. And then we will take open questions from all of you. So, without much ado, let's begin. My first uh, panelist here is Saibola. Ziarman. He is the chairman of WTC Afghanistan. And I request you, uh, Zebi Basaibola, please uh, give us your perspective on reconstructing hope. Thank you very much, uh, Anadis Salva. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be <coughs> this panel and to discuss about the most interesting topic of all time reconstructing hope. Um, <coughs> Start my points with a very brief definition of hope. From my point of view, uh, life is hope, hope is life. So when there is no hope, there is no life. Uh, if you look into uh, the past earthquake which happened in this city that we are currently having in Spana, uh, the Gazante earthquake, uh, it was a natural disaster which happened and uh, a calamity which took a lot of hopes and it broke in a lot of hopes. Uh, I came from Afghanistan, although I, 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 uh, I, I'm living in Dubai, but originally from Afghanistan. And during the past few weeks, there is a series of earthquakes happening in the West Afghanistan. And a lot of lives was lost. So it means a lot of hopes was gone, a lot of hopes were broken. Uh, and this is not going to be the first, and it's not going to be the last one as well. There are lots of conflicts, war, climate change, natural disaster. And nowadays, even the AI, which is coming up. So these are all the reasons that's going to be picking our hopes and breaking our hopes. And we have to be prepared in order to, to, to tackle these challenges and to recover from these uh, factors, which is broken our hopes and, and taking lives and hopes. Uh, also, I give another uh, good example of the hope that uh, even displacement of the people can, uh, immigrants, that people are moving from one location to another one, so they're looking for hope because they don't, they're not hopeful for the society, the community that they are living inside. And the reason uh, for, for them to take the life breaks and move, moving forward uh, to another continent, to another country, because they are seeking hope and they are uh, looking for a hopeful future. Like long time back, 
Maulana, which is built in, in, in Cunha, and uh, it's, it's a, it's a, a very uh, uh, common and uh, international uh, scholar of the past time and even nowadays. So his father moved from Afghanistan, from Baal, then to Iraq, then to Mecca, and finally he settled in Cunha. And the reason for, for them at that time was they were looking for a hopeful society and they wanted to live in a hopeful society. So that was, that was the cost uh, for that. I'll give you another practical, real life example of my own. When I was living in Kabul during the, during the 19 decades when the Taliban was ruling in Afghanistan, so the entire society was broken. And I was a student at the school and including myself, my family, most of the people and an entire nation was hopeless because of the situation, because of the disasters which people were struggling. But still, uh, despite of being hopeless, still we were hopeful for bright horizons of tomorrow. <coughs> and finally, and in 2000, after 2001, 2002, it happened. And there was a new hope has been brought to Afghanistan for the people, including for myself, and it changed my life. That hope has changed my life. The life of so many other people, the life of my generation. And that hope was brought by international community. And again, unfortunately, that, that, that hope was taken back by international community after 20 years of war, conflict, rebuilding, reconstruction. And all of them. So again, it was taken back by the international community. But still, our people are hopeful for the bright horizons of tomorrow. So it's human factor. We are the ones that who are bringing hopes for a next generation, and we are the people that who are taking the hopes from the next generation. So basically, I can say that that hope, reconstructing hope, should be a job and a mandate for each and every human being. So it's the job of everyone to reconstruct hope, no matter by giving a glass of water for a person who's thirsty and who's in need of water. So you give them life, you give them hope for them. So basically, reconstructing hope means reconstructing lives. And there's no more holy and important and significant job for each of us to reconstruct hope and reconstruct the lives of the people. When we're talking about the global goals, Sustainable Development Goals, which was set by the United Nations. We're not far away from, from the deadline, which was put 2013. So these are all, I can say that these are uh, global hopes, goals, I can call. Can you give me another minute? I know I'm running out of time. Yeah, please. Yeah, I have to just conclude one. Yeah, point. please. Yeah. So in order to reconstruct hope, there are so many things which you have to do, because how are you going to measure reconstructing hope? So the, 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 the measurement for the constructing hope is that we need a lot of reconstruction projects, rebuilding a lot of projects, rebuilding, creating resilient societies, developing institutional cap capacities, strengthening the local governments, uh, providing food security, creating employment uh, and job opportunities for the people, rebuilding and reconstructing our infrastructure projects, and rebuilding our education projects, making the, the new generations, the future generations, to educate based on, on the market needs and the uh, market-driven needs by the businesses. And uh, uh, at the same time, we have to be uh, prepared for the natural disasters, wars, conflicts, and the AI, which is coming up, taking our jobs in order to avoid them. At the same time, the diseases, the pandemic, which happened also, 2020, so it took a lot of hopes, broken a lot of lives. But this is not the first one, it's not going to be the last one. There are more disasters, there are more panics going to be coming. So we have to be prepared in order to avoid taking the hopes from the people, but instead to, to, to struggle with these challenges and bringing hopes and giving hopes for the people. There's a poem also, which is mainly focused on, 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 on the hope and how the people should be hopeful. It's part of the challenges, it's part of the issues. But there's no time. I'm going to be putting yeah, I'm going to ask you in the wrap up session to read Absolutely. that poem for sure. Thank you, Zaidullah. It was wonderful. Our next panelist is, it has been a TED Talk speaker. And she's a wonderful, energetic woman. Her name is Karen Tess. 
I'm sorry, I pronounced the surname again. <laughs> She's the founder and CEO of International Bridges of Justice, Switzerland. And her eclectic energy is going to get everyone uh, more energized. And I'm looking forward to her input and her contribution on this very important subject. Over to you, Karen. Good morning. I'm, I'm also sorry that I can't see everybody. So, <laughs> let us see. I'd actually like to begin first with some words that I thought of that aren't mine, that are anonymous, but bring us together in hope. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and wonder to this universe, to this community, and to each other. Hope is something that is with all of us. And I think, obviously, you all have had some experiences of hope, and we're interested in hearing your experiences of hope, or you wouldn't be here today and this morning. So I thank you first for joining us, because I believe that hope is also a choice and a decision. Hope is there, but it's in us. And it is, as one person said, or many people have said, it is also something that stands in between. It's not just the, it's, somebody said once that it's not the plausibility, it's the plausibility of the possible, as opposed to the necessity of the probable. That's kind of, in some ways, the David and Goliath story. You don't think that David is going to win, because if you look at it in terms of probability, it looks like it's going to be Goliath every time, but sometimes David wins. For me, it's also defenders and seeing people in the world who have decided that they will move forward with this. So my name is Karen Chant. I'm the founder of International Bridges of Justice. And for me, it's really the defenders every day throughout the world who go into the darkest corners. What we do with International Bridges of Justice is we provide lawyers to those who have been accused of crimes. So as you might know, every day in countries throughout the world, people are arbitrarily detained and tortured and don't have a lawyer. And yet, at the same time, there are laws on the books that say you have a right to a lawyer and a right not to be tortured. This has been true for decades. In 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights clearly states that every person should have a lawyer and should be protected from torture. And yet, at the same time, this is not implemented. So I founded International Bridges of Justice in the year 2000 because I recognized that despite the fact that the laws were there, and many countries said, okay, you can come in and work with us, that unfortunately, many people in the world, including the world community, did not have hope for this. They said the laws are there, but what can we really do? It's hopeless, and we'll leave it. So I started myself as a public defender, as a public defender in San Francisco, I some of you are from the States, and then moved to Cambodia in the year 1994. At that point, because of the Khmer Rouge, there were less than 20 attorneys in the country, meaning the Khmer Rouge had killed everybody. And even 20 years later, you would walk into prisons and you would see um, women in prison and they'd say, you know, my husband committed a crime 10 years ago, but they couldn't find him. They also said, or you wouldn't say, but we would walk into prison and you'd see children in prison for, for many, many different reasons. One of these was a 12-year-old boy who had stolen a bicycle. And I remember as I sort of looked into his eyes and realized that for myself and many of my friends, that even though we had before, even in our college activist years, written letters for everybody, we would not have written a letter to this 12-year-old boy because he didn't do anything important. He wasn't a political prisoner. He had simply stolen a bicycle. And at that point, recognizing that there was a gap between the laws and the possibilities, because the Cambodian government said, don't touch my five political prisoners, but if you want to help the rest, if you want to help these 95% who are in a broken down economic system, then, then go right ahead. So International Bridges of Justice does exactly that, works to give people systematic early access to a lawyer. 
And today, the defenders go into really the darkest places, the darkest corners, and bring their light. Many people said, like the defenders who are throughout the world, you don't have, now I'm going to use a bad word, but they said, you don't have a snowball's chance in hell. But they came, they worked. We have defenders throughout the world in 52 countries. They've taken over half a million cases and are creating change. So I think hope is possibility and people acting in it. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Our next panelist is Art Levinson, artist and writer of the end of hope. So that's going to be an interesting one. <laughs> Um, Magdalen College, Oxford, United Kingdom. So over to you, Art. Thank you very much. In 1820, some 200 years ago, just after the seven Napoleon, Napoleonic Wars, wars amongst many wars, George Hegel, in his Elements of the Philosophy of Right, tried to reconstruct the modern state, in effect the world he lived in. And this was also during the time of the Industrial Revolution. For him, what to do in conflicts between natural law or an absence of law, which for Hegel was despotism, of which we have a lot today. In a nutshell, free will, a great striving for that around the world today, was paramount to Hegel for any human construct or reconstruct, such as economy, family, law, politics, morality, and property. To quote him, a person is not truly free unless they are a participant in all these different aspects of the life of the state. Karl Marx, in 1843, some 20 years later, in the criticism of Hegel's work, wrote a phrase that, I'm, that all may know, but which has been truncated. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of a soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. Cyber pressed in a heartless world under soulless conditions has echoes across all wars, political intolerance in almost every country today. Yet while there are huge political, economic, climatic challenges to face in each nation and also nation against nation, block against block, how can we reconstruct hope to shape a brighter future? We can't. Hope is the sign of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the fentanyl of the people. Fentanyl because it's in synthetic, man-made, our situation, our reason. Climate destruction is a given man-made. Ukraine, a breadbasket to the world, is now in part a wilderness of coal destructive and not in any way productive iron mines intercessing wars everywhere. We cannot get along and enjoy this amazing, fruitful planet. The oppressed, heartless, soulless conditions is at every. The list is endless. We cannot even hope against hope anymore. Why not? Because of the nature of hope. It is an emotion, not a virtue. The opposite of fear or despair. It is just letting our thoughts or beliefs project a positive or negative future but over which we do not control. It is just lies, self-deception and a vice. For Stockton and the Stockton Principle, it was proved a vice that led to untimely deaths. For Kant, in his Metaphysics of Morals, it is an effective desire for an alternative possible outcome with a moral duty, but one based on rationality. Hope has outlived its place. It has become the sentinel, a deadly sin used with substantial ease by politicians in both a negative and positive form of falsified virtue or abusive fear. Reconstruction is just a tinker to the appearance and not the essence. To replace hope, a concept of the mind with another construct today is needed to be able to cope with the challenges facing humanity. How can we reconstruct hope to shape a better future or brighter future? What catalyst is needed to nurture that momentum on a global, on a global scale? I believe we must first accept the end of hope and replace it with something like conceptual realism, a reality that is based by the mind to the brutal facts around us, but not a mind thing. Perhaps the equation is, this equation is useful. CR, conceptual realism, equals essence, 
not appearance, that is, logical, ethical, aesthetic conscience, all raised to the power of consciousness. Hope falsifies and petrifies the internal world of mankind and prevents us from imagining an external world, that is to say, a vision of it which is not simply utilitarian, self-promotional, or mine, so to speak. It prevents a truer and more exact representation of life by preventing retaining the durable characteristics of our planet and life and promotes simple, glancing solutions. We need to see all aspects, conceptual realism, Thought evolves, and we need a new concept of the world, not a new hoped for one. We can change a reality by changing our minds. We deceive ourselves if we rely only on hope to do this. The more realistic one, the less politicians will be able to lie. The tools I'm not sure, but I believe, perhaps even have faith in the biological function of art, not in humans though by the brutal realism that opposing religions or politicians will not go away and we have to work together by empathy, by trying to show what we call sometimes the psychopaths that rule and wish to enrich and enlarge is futile, that their talents are better spent for people than killing them. Not a hope against hope, but only the only realistic way. I think the world must be blind and hope has blinded us. Hope is part of the problem not part of the solution. Thank you. And that's very interesting. Oh, I was expecting that. And you shine in that. Thank you so much. It's given us a lot that we're going to use in our open forum discussion. Come back to this. But we first finish the round with the remaining panelists. Thank you so much. Our next panelist is Saurabh Tak. He's an investment manager with Sagana from Switzerland. Over to you, Saurabh. Thank you, Anne. Um, since my fellow panelists have been taking a human-centric view and going to take a planet-centric view, basically, um, what, what we have been doing, basically, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm a scientist turned investment professional. So I dedicated over 10 years of my life to studying genetics and life sciences, basically. So I have a rather philosophical, scientific way of looking at things, and I really think what we're looking at is is very small as, as compared to what is going to happen in the very, very near future. What we are doing is, is really taking a human-centric view. We need, really need to take a planet-centric planet view. We need to change the narrative. We need to change the thought process of seeing, basically, that, that the planet belongs to us rather than, rather to, we belong to this planet. The planet was there before us. It might not be there basically because we are destroying it as, as completely. To, to go a little bit back basically, all the living beings, in particular humans, we are driven by, by one particular need that our species survive. How do we do it? We, ma we make sure that our children survive and, that, and behind it, all of, behind all of it, there is one particular instinct that our genes survive. What we have been doing in the last 200 years uh, or last 300 years, basically, to, we have been changing the, the ecosystem to the point that the age today is called the age of Anthropocene, the age of human beings. And this is where, where the entire problem is, basically. So if we want to go towards hope, we need to bring change. We need to bring change today. We need to bring change now. We are at a threshold. We literally are at a threshold. So every, imagine a dam, basically. It fills, it fills, it fills. It fills to a point and it can hold for a long time. We are at the point where it can just hold enough for us to change now. It breaks and all hell breaks loose. Uh, let me go back, how do we reconstruct hope? So let me go back to how humans came to be basically. Uh, when we were just evolving out of primates basically, and when I say primates, think of chimpanzees, gorillas, we were quite similar to them. How do you think we came as a species alive, dominating the world, while chimpanzees and gorillas did not? Why are we the only species basically ruling the world the way we are, ruling this planet the way we are? There's a reason behind it. We came together. We learned to live in communities. If you think the biggest inventions or discoveries that humans did, humans did was fire. We, no, we are wrong. We are absolutely wrong. 
the single biggest element in the human evolution that made us who we are was community building. We have forgotten that. We are fighting, fighting, fighting. We are fighting over resources. We are fighting over the smallest things that, that should not matter. And we have forgotten what we are. We are homo sapiens, we are human beings. We are community builders. We have forgotten the meaning of community. So only when we rise above these things, I think we can give a meaning to hope. Till we do this, for me there is no hope. But the hope comes from that change. The hope comes from that element of change. I just want to add uh, one anecdote to it, let's say. A few years ago, I was working uh, five, four, five years ago when I switched gears basically and I moved to investment side of things uh, to, to give basically the last meaning of hope, what it stands for me, why I'm here basically. I was working on a project where the babies could not survive past the age of six months. So they will die at six months. And I had to look at those babies basically to study their symptoms so that I can replicate it in an animal model. All of this basically, all of these disasters, even genetic disasters are happening because of the age of human beings. And to correlate it basically, because of climate change, they, is, they, are, they are permafrost melting. And we recently went through COVID and I'm, I'm connecting all the dots now. There are so many viruses in this permafrost from 20,000 years ago that we do not have the immunity to. Do you think we can survive another COVID? COVID was a trailer. The film is yet to come. So if we are to survive this, we need to come back as a community. We need to, we need to look everything at the planet. We need to have the holistic approach. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And we will come back to that in the uh, open discussion, which is going to happen shortly. Very interesting points you've got. It. Thank you so much. Um, our next panelist is Michael Hayden. He's a researcher in philosophy, University of Salzburg, Austria. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. Um, I want to start my part with a quote as well, which I always find very inspiring. And it's not from an artist, it's not from a writer, it's from a computer scientist, Donald Knut, who said, um, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And Donald Knut was very heavy invested in machine learning. And of course, the context in which he said it was, um, if you teach an AI certain things very early on, and you think you got it right, Usually what happens is there are very big mistakes waiting for you down the line. And I think this quote can be applied very well also in the context of hope and about our species, what we do. Because um, what a lot of philosophers, biologists note, when you look at humans, homo sapiens and other species on Earth, we are basically infants. We are very, very young. We don't exist very long. And what we do now when we look at crises, at global problems, we, we try to optimize. We try to optimize prematurely. Because um, we, we see these big problems, climate change, refugees, um, war, resource depletion, and we think we need, as a species, we need this one plan that we have to act on. But that's usually not how large problems are solved. Large problems are usually solved step by step, not by one person with a big plan, but with millions of people with millions of little plans. And I find it very important to keep that in mind when it comes to hope, to realize that actually we don't know as much as we think we do, but we're still trying to progress and become better. And especially when I talk about big issues, I often feel like there is a lot of negativity coming that you don't see necessarily in smaller issues where people might have a more intuitive feel to it. Maybe to use a personal anecdote, I'm very, I'm a big uh, proponent of the European Union, I'm very big on European integration. I'm very vocal about it and that leads to some discussions. And when you enter like very big discussions about the European Commission, about European Parliament, this gets very heated. And usually when it happens to me, I try to switch. I usually ask people, you know, do you think that people who live in, say, 
the western part of Germany, where the nearest hospital is in France, where the nearest school is in France. Do you think that those children should go to the school in France? Do you think they should be able to go to the hospital across the border? And suddenly there's no disagreement, like as if there was no conflict at all. And I think this is because when we talk about these very, very big issues, we lose sight of the things that matter. And very often what matters are the little things. I think also what Zeli said, that in, in very small things, host a refugee, offer something shelter, you, we don't alone, we, we don't, we're not able right now to solve these things holistically as one person, but each person, each of us can do the little part. And maybe what the philosopher Karl Popper once said, what he what he what his problem was in science, he says, was the lack of epistemic humility. That scientists were often thinking that they had to uh, justify the hypothesis, they had to prove the hypothesis. And Popper's approach, which was revolutionary at the time, was to say, no, if you have a hypothesis as a scientist, what you should do is try to find out why you're wrong. And you should find people who tell you you're wrong. Because it's very, very difficult, actually, to find out what you know, but it's a lot easier to find out what you don't know. And by ruling out things you don't know, then that's how you progress. And maybe to wrap this up with another philosopher of science, I like to call the philosophers of science, um, Thomas Kuhn, which was actually a very opposite of Karl Popper. Thomas Kuhn's whole idea of science was that we progress in science by hypotheses and assumptions that we take as true, and we use them to solve certain problems that we have. And what got Thomas Kuhn a very, very bad reputation, actually, was this idea that we cannot compare uh, earlier scientific findings to our previous ones. So maybe use one example. In Aristotle's physics, one of the most important questions was, what's the natural place of objects? And for Kuhn, this, this point was, it's not just that we are now, we know more than Aristotle, we are better than Aristotle. We can't even really understand what we know more and what we know less because Aristotle just asked many different questions. And Thomas Kuhn died in the early 2000s, but he became very um, famous for a short while in 2016 after fake news and everything became very prominent. It was suddenly people thought that he was kind of the problem behind this because people thought that Thomas Kuhn got rid of truth and of objectivity. And, but there's a very beautiful part in, in one of his books and that I have to paraphrase. He says, Science is not, uh, it's not progress towards a goal that we know already. Science is an evolutionary tree which branches that grow into ways that we can't even predict yet. But yet, through these branches and how these branches grow, we can make progress. And I think that hope and the attitude of trying to do something, even small thing, while you don't know where you're going, but you know much less than you actually think you do, I think this hope is what gives water to the tree. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Much appreciated. Good point. Um, our next panelist is Con Frost, the founder of the Consciousness University, Switzerland. Good morning. Um, what I'm going to say is going to challenge every one of you mentally. The reason being is that you are all governed by an egocentric identity that is an illusion. And it creates the thinking that you're comfortably operating with. All the speakers have said problems, and we all have to come together to try to solve that. But we have to go to the core of the problem, not the multitude of problems that we currently face. If we go to the core, then everything else becomes easy. Otherwise, we're all fractionalized trying to solve little problems, a million of different ideas coming out, and it doesn't necessarily work cohesively. So what is the core problem? We look at the uh, atomic um, bulletin of scientists. We look at the doomsday <coughs> clock that some of you may be familiar with that was orientated 1947 at seven minutes to midnight, and midnight being Armageddon. You ask the question, over the years, what has happened? And what has happened is certain times have been good, and certain times have been bad. Okay, a big Cuban Missile Crisis bad, Berlin Wall coming down, good. And that moves the clock forwards and backwards, sometimes 17 minutes away from midnight. But in 2009, a film came out called The Watchman. And in that, it cited the doomsday clock. 
And it looked at the world's ending at that moment, at four minutes to midnight. It was on the threshold of destruction. So where are we now in terms of clock to midnight? We're at 90 seconds to midnight. And the main reason for the 90 seconds to midnight is nothing to do with climate change. Nothing to do with anything else but human beings' level of consciousness. We have to trace that story back to where it began. And where it began was we all were born with a genius level of innovative creative capacity. This is all of us, 98% of children, unless you've got some kind of cognitive dis disimpairment. We all went to school. <coughs> were exposed to something called the rote learning system for 10 to 15 years. Now, you can all ignore what I'm saying, but it's the most important lesson you will ever learn from school. That 10 years of your brain being immersed into an environment changes the neuroplasticity of your brain. It suppresses your thinking into convergent left brain thinking at the expense of hemispheric, hemispheric synchronization, divergent thinking. It means that we are, and we use a very uncomfortable word here, retarded as a race. We are stupid, but you all use an egocentric identity to overcome that and think you know what you know. By the time we get to 25, our fluid intelligence is virtually zero because of the road learning system that has moved the brain into that convergent left brain thought. It has removed our problem saving capacity. You will all remember at school how much creativity was in school. It was about an hour and a half. How much creative problem solving? It was all memorization and repetition. Because your brain was put in that situation for those 10 to 15 years, your brain went through something called synaptic pruning, which meant it optimizes for non-thinking, for needing leadership, non-creativity. This is where you all are right now. So what's the answer to that? We cannot use the thinking that we've always used to get us out of the problem because the thinking we currently have has got us in the problem. This is as basic as it gets, and you now know why it's happened. But there is an answer to this. We change the educational system. It has to be revamped. It's a 200-year-old thing orientated by the Prussians to get people to operate within armies, to go to line or square very quickly, to take orders. People need leaders, but they do not lead themselves. We all have immense capacity in the brain. And we all, regardless of our age, have something called neuroplasticity throughout our lives. The peak decade of human cognitive performance is 60 to 70. The second peak decade is 70 to 80. And the third peak decade is 50 to 60. Which in our society, we have a situation where we think it's over at 30, 40. It's us, the people in this room, who have got some years under their belt that can change the world. But to do that, we have to change our thinking. And that means going through a process of reconstructing our brains. This is not information. This is a technique of information. We have to re-engage the fluid intelligence in the mind. This jacks up the capacity of your brain massively, which is fundamentally important if you want to interface with artificial general intelligence, will at some point ask each and every one of you, why do you think what you think? Why do you believe what you believe? And why do you do what you do? And if you do not have expansive answers to that, then I'm afraid you will be deemed useless to the future. Artificial general intelligence and artificial consciousness is not a bad thing. It's the next step of human revolution. That was wonderful, thank you. So when we talk about hope, there is individual hope, there is a communal hope, and so it's local and global. There are conversations that happen every day on this subject. There are panels like ours that come together with thought leaders. But what we see as the biggest problem is an execution plan an action plan, individual action plan, and a societal action plan. Because the results speak otherwise from all the great education that has been given to our generation and the leadership that's there in the corporate world. 
why are we still having such situations that are as dire as displacement of human beings, which throws life out of balance, which negates uh, memories and moments and, and lands that you've come from into places that you do not know where you're going. Why are people subject to that? Why are people put through war when two uh, countries, which is government bodies, have disagreements, but the victims are children, the victims are civilians? We are talking about an educated class which is still behaving like the Dark Ages. How different are we? So we're going to have some questions for you, which we're going to, I want to ask the panelists, and also like the audience to jump in if they want. What are the actionable steps that we can individually and collectively do to keep hope alive? Now hope is a terminology that can be changed with various words. But the fact that you wake up every morning as a human being want to make a difference to your life and the lives around you is significant. If you wake up in the morning and there's no purpose, if you wake up in the morning and there's nothing to look forward to, then what are you going to give to the next generation? So I'd like to start with the first question to the panel. How can we reconstruct hope? Now this comes from a humanitarian point of view, educational point of view, society point of view, psychological point of view. You can add all those point of views, but the question is, how can we create hope to shape a brighter <coughs> future? So. Um, I'll go back to my initial point. We need to see the planet as a whole, not countries, not continents. And when I say that, what I mean is we need to build resilient ecosystems that transfer these boundaries. Basically. For me, this is, this is how we reconstruct hope. Uh, Thank you. Um, is that okay? I think I already talked about it. So yeah, so just briefly, and yeah, the audience. It's a good job. I can say very briefly that to reconstruct hope, we have to reconstruct a lot of things. <coughs> rebuilding resilient uh, societies, uh, rebuilding our infrastructures, rebuilding our economies, mm -hmm. rebuilding our wealth generation systems in order to support the new generation entrepreneurs <coughs> and the market and creating jobs for the people that bring bringing more hopes for the people and being prepared for the future wars, conflicts, national disasters, and the pandemics. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I guess I would also emphasize my previous point again. What we probably need from a psychological view is epistemic humility. We realize that we know much less than we think we do, but at the same time, try to find little things where we can have an impact with the attitudes that we're still learning, we can improve, and when it comes to big societal changes, try to implement ways, institutions, procedures that allow for criticism and allow to make the people make decisions more often. Thank you. Colin? First off, the current leadership is psychopathic. If you accept that, you accept that anything you do and think is completely useless. It's always going to be within a pyramid system of power leading to about 300 having 99% of the wealth. If you don't accept that, then you're going to continue the same <coughs> physical human progress that we've had and start reveling in your egocentric identity, as I mentioned. You have to accept that we're in a game that's rigged and you have to change it. But when we walk into this life, we walk into a gambling den where the, to the table is owned, the cards are owned, the dice are owned, the lights are owned, the building are owned, and your brain is owned, and as I've said, it's conditioned. Until you recognize that, you are pissing up against a wall. I'm going to put it as bluntly as that. And each and every one of you will have the responsibility in the future to determine why you did nothing, why you didn't set the real view and accept just followed your own little path. You all have to come together collectively. And you have to look at, as I said, the core situation. You have to look at what you're up against and you have to start not revolution, because that's violent. You have to start revolution. And that starts inside your head. Thank you, Karen. In order for us to reconstruct anything, we must first look at what the original purpose was. I think one of the most important things is that we, again, 
look at what was the original purpose of hope. And to me, hope connects our dreams. And it's the infrastructure that connects our imaginings, our imagination and our imaginings of the bridge that can bring us from our current to present to the future. Thank you. Again, Alan? Well, my, my position is simple. We, we can't reconstruct hope and uh, to try and bring about some action taken from what the other speakers have said. I think the idea of a collection, a collective approach is, uh, to try and communicate is, is, is important. I think that's what you were saying. And uh, art, I think, does that uh, very strongly. I think the time clock is in a different time zone. I think we passed 90 seconds. We may, we may try and go back, but, but it's over. And I think uh, your position of making small steps is a very important one. Um, but how to communicate the importance of that, I think, is important. And I, perhaps I can only say, give a quote from Shakespeare, which I like very much, which he said, in nature, there's no blemish but the mind. None can be called deformed but the unkind. And I think kindness is a way of not restructuring hope. Kindness is a way forward of the step that avoids hope at all costs. So I want to ask the panelists, what change in narrative do we need in the current crisis situations that have been happening for the last few years? The world has seen first COVID and the wars, the displacement, um, economic struggle, inflation, and that is having an effect psychologically on people individually. So according to uh, these questions to the panelists, uh, what, do we, what do we have to change? What is the new narrative in this current situation that we need? I cannot really change my answer on the narrative. The narrative will for me, the larger picture remains the planet because we cannot keep looking at human centric approach. But having said that, a little bit deeper into it, we need to make resilient economies because touching what Karen was saying and what Michael was saying a bit basically, we do not, or, or in general, this, this, this room, let's say, is a, is a set of intellectuals that we're sitting here and we are discussing this. How many of, of us or our kind is basically discussing this or even thinking about it. So if those if we cannot have a collective action, if we cannot influence an action that can be taken by a larger population or larger community, we can discuss all we want and it will never happen. So the changing the narrative should be in a way that it influences a very, very big population. And there is only one way around it, one practical way around it, the way I see it is to make very resilient economies all over the globe. Thank you. Uh, very good question. Now, actually, we see a lot of issues around ourselves in today's world. And in order to change the narrative, first of all, who should change the narrative uh, to have a bigger impact at the global level? The major responsibility is on the politicians and the political system, the global political system has to change. And this narrative has to be changed at that level in order to avoid the conflicts and avoid the enmity among the human being and to promote and talk more about the reconciliations among the human factors. And apart from that one, the economical system also, we have to change the narratives of the current uh, group system because it's not a fair system. Uh, everyone doesn't have access to uh, the required resources and opportunities. Part of the world, the human factor, they have a different lifestyle, they have more prosperity, prosperity in their lives, and the other part of the world, they are living in disaster. Yeah. yeah. So this needs a global initiative and a global real cooperation and approaches in order to uh, provide equal and fair opportunities for each and every human being around this planet. Thank you so much. I, I found this question very important because um, I recently read a, a study that said when people become more pessimistic about the future, their thinking becomes more zero sum. And so I, I think that very ties perfectly into this because um, the current narrative I often see 
especially when you talk about big issues about economics, geopolitics, is that we think that your gain has to be my loss. And that's a very destructive narrative that I think has taken over. And to, I think the most important thing to change that is to emphasize that, no, of course not everything can be situated where both people win, but usually we can rephrase definitely a lot of narratives that we have now from zero sum to everyone can gain. And the things that have to be zero sum are often easier resolved when you try to get away from the more abstract level and get back to the smaller concrete things and saying, yes, you have to help someone else, but you might benefit as well in the future, or maybe you have a duty to help others. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you much. appreciate it. Come. There's two issues here. One is human beings do not want to grow, they do not want to change, they resist change at every level because they don't have the cognitive function, as I've explained, to be able to cope with change. We can change that because um, through intelligence in a person's brain, the neuroplasticity goes throughout the life if they are challenged in the right way. And there is a process to achieve synaptogenesis so you will jack up your minds massively. The other thing is that all problems we currently face are irrelevant. That's because we're facing the biggest problem that we're not looking at, and most, most people don't talk about, it. and that's artificial consciousness. And why call it consciousness? It will be a greater consciousness as us, because we're going to have quantum computing, which is a million times faster than we're currently looking at. We're going to see change beyond our comprehension, beyond our capacity, in every aspect. The political system will fall, the economic system will fall, the monetary systems will fall, the everything will fall. It's going to go away because we're going to have an optimized situation of artificial intelligence that just thinks faster than everybody here. They will have the absolute future already planned out. That can seem daunting to people because their brains are just not capable of understanding that and they will resist that fact. But artificial general intelligence is likely to be here in the next two to five years, not 50. So all our problems of economics, poverty, everything go away very, very rapidly. But what we have a problem with is the psychological problem of how we cope with change at that pace. Most people can't change very rapidly when their partner walks out the door. They have a complete meltdown. You just imagine the entire world changing in front of you and you trying to cope with it. This is why mental agility is the thing that you need to focus on, to be able to think in a way that you're coping with things that you don't even know at the moment. If you can't do that, I'm afraid you're a dinosaur and you're extinct. And that's why the human race is divided into two capacities. Those that don't want to think, don't want to change, and that includes the political leadership, and those that do. And that's a consciousness movement that the average person is now ascending to a point where they're just fed up with the information and the bullshit that they've been faced with. And they're now prepared to come together and work together without the need for leaders that they want to listen to with pontificate and platforms about what serves them because they're psychopathic and their tendency. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Karen. Why? You don't want to be a dinosaur. You will never be a dinosaur. Thank you. <laughs> so we are in Gaziantep, and on Tuesday, right after this conference ends, a number of our defenders are coming from Syria to meet together. And I know that the real reason, although we call it a strategy session, and we are going to be looking at how we can defend and what we should do strategically in terms of working with bees and torture, that one of the real reasons everyone is coming together is because of stories and narrative of how we can move forward together. We work in countries throughout the world where it is a very, very difficult, challenging, and dark situation. From Syria to Myanmar, where there are, we've got five defender centers, whereas often the defenders themselves go into hiding to do what they can do. And, and what I recognize is that it's that they change their narrative so that they can choose hope and keep moving forward. And I remember one time we were on a Zoom call and our defender in Burundi said, I think this is impossible. We have less than 100 attorneys in the country. We can't possibly <coughs> defend all these people who are there, who are being tortured, what can we do? And I remember that the Cambodian lawyer opened and said, oh, don't be ridiculous. When I started in Cambodia, we had 10. And although it wasn't, it wasn't a competition, like I had 10, you have 100, we could do it. It was more that, look, we can do this. And I think that we need to change our narrative of what we can do as individuals and as a community to move forward, whatever that is. Thanks.
Dan, on. Um, I'm very interested to hear some of what the speakers have said, including the, the uh, tremendous uh, power of artificial intelligence and its damage and the need to uh, change. And uh, when you talk about change, uh, I think I understood changing the thing. Uh, mental agility. I, I do believe in conceptual realism, and I think we need to absolutely change the way we think. I do like the idea of that uh, we belong to the planet and not vice versa. And all these things, we have to really change our narrative, but nothing to do with hope. And um, I can only, again, I like referring back to art. And there's a, a double painting by Picasso on War and Peace. And in the, in, the, in, the, in the picture on peace, there's a, 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 an image of some fish in a cage. And Picasso was asked, well, how can you put fish in a cage? And he said, uh, everything is possible in peace. So I think we really have to change so dramatically and so quickly. Yeah, that's wonderful, Art. Now, taking that point forward, uh, before I come, yes, yes, please, go ahead. Can you state your name first, please? Sorry, I don't know if you're opening up to the floor yet, but I just, I, I thank you for everything that's been said. <clears throat> I just wanted to talk about how we generate hope, and one of the ways is vision, and I think that's a piece that's missing from the discussion, because at the moment we have a system that functions on the basis that more is, it ine is inevitably going to solve the world's problems, and we can see that it hasn't. Yes. So in order to shift direction and do all the things that the panel suggested, we need to have a vision of where we want to go. We need, yeah. to hold, we need to hold the connectivity that we've heard. We need to hold the planet. We need to hold justice. We need to hold kindness. We need to hold compassion. And unless we have that vision, we won't have hope. And I just wanted to say one more thing. It isn't just art that generates hope. Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, One Leaf, on a tree was enough to give them the hope to survive and so hope is there we can take it where we find it and it's innate in us thank you so much uh, your name is jennifer nadel compassion oh, Jen. politics thank you so much uh, yes uh, actually the last question was going to come to that one the actionable and the visions because i'd like to share some inputs having worked in social change activism and being an author I have worked with various agencies and it's heartbreaking when we get statistics compared to locally when we meet people who are like-minded and we think the world is pretty cushy for us because they relate to us, we relate to them, but we have to look at the world holistically, you know. There are people on one side of the world that can't get clean drinking water, as Saurabh was talking about. On the other side, there's empowerment of both genders and, you know, people fighting for their rights and people listening to them. When we look at the statistics of United Nations on domestic violence, we are totally shaken up to hear that one out of three women in the world is the victim of social violence. That's way more than COVID happened. When we look at the number of displaced people in the world that don't have a home, don't feel welcome, it's heartbreaking because the fact is all of this psychologically affects a human being. Now we're not talking money yet, we're just talking the mind, the broken mind. If you take a broken glass which is broken due to the environment, decisions from governments, and then you pour water into it, it's just going to fall through. The levels of rage that have gone up in the world and the lack of empathy. <coughs> We're not even coming to kindness. We're still talking empathy as a human being. People have become immune to that. And I'm going to share an example coming from India. In Mumbai, when a foreigner comes and takes a taxi and goes on the road and sees um, children whose limbs are mutilated because they belong to a cartel where money is collected by the cartel head. The child is drugged, there's a woman who takes the child around and the person who sees that is moved with emotions and starts crying and tries to give money and says, can I help you? But when you see the locals in Mumbai, they're driving around that road every day. They become immune to it. So there are things in this world that societies have made us so accustomed to seeing without bringing in any change. There is no vision of how they're going to remove these issues that are there. 
beautiful question from Jennifer. So I want to ask the panelists and the attend people who have been kind enough to attend our panel, what are the actionables as an individual you can do, whether it is you doing it through your company or collaboration or through systems or technology, that we can actually measure it. Because I'm going to quote Malala, who was talking about education of the girl child. She goes to the conference and says that, I've come here five years, but the results are pretty much the same. I mean, so we talk, but we need action. Change is in the mind, yes, of course. Everyone wants to make everything better. That's the way human beings are from inside. Or will say that's not hope, maybe it's the construct. Oh, Kern will say that's the consciousness. But yes, it is the consciousness. And today, the consciousness is reaching out to people in individual capacities. So I'd like to ask the panel, what's the vision and what's the action? What's the action? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm Simone Filippini. Um, I will lead another panel which is on thriving cities, different subject, but always connected. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say something that I think you see that we need action at different levels. Of course, we all need to personally contribute, but and uh, doing concrete actions like helping people on the ground is important. I've been the director of two different NGOs and I've been an ambassador also. And I've seen, you know, yeah, as a person you can make a difference. Organizations can make a difference for people living in abject poverty or other dire situations. But it doesn't change the systems. And the systems, they, 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 they fuck up the world. And basically it's what, what Kern says. Um, we are being led by psychopaths. But yeah. people who don't have the capacity and abilities and competencies and ethics and what have you to lead the world towards something better. Look just at the brutal reactions that we now see happening, the toxic masculine language being uttered around the Palestine-Israeli conflict. Yeah. It's, it's disgusting to look at. And we need to work on system change. And that system change is connected to changing the leaders that are leading us to destruction on the most pity, opportunistic uh, um, interest that they represent. Correct. It has nothing to do with the common good. And so my goal would be, and I would love to set up something like that. That is my leadership for SDGs thing that I thought of after having looked around in the world for 30 years and thought, well, it's not going to happen unless we do something. And nobody does something about this. Help our leaders to become better leaders. Uh, in different ways, I think Kern could have a wonderful contribution. Art could help. We need to expand their brains. They, it, they're regressive. So, I would love, I have a concept, I would love to meet people who want to help, set up something, and I, I have complete ideas, um, but it's, it goes far too far now to, to share them, but please, um, let's do something together and make a concrete result of this conference that really uh, uh, helps us in, in a way to, to to improve leadership, because if we don't do that, we are, we are going down the drain, all of us. I couldn't agree more, because at a conference when you speak and you leave, the subject is left back. So yes, we should not let the subject be left back, we should let, look at this as an opportunity for collaboration together, to you know, put our voices collectively out there. Yeah. Yes, my yes, yes, This is Mayur from India, and uh, Wonderful discussion, and I think I can understand it because we don't need to around. I think hope starts with our own self, and it's, it's a very individual thing actually. And a little change that we observe, I think we should recognize that. I think life is about small things, not big things. Mm -hmm. So if we observe small change in people around us, we must appreciate it. And we learn from people. I think 
I picked up a couple of things from this discussion this morning, and many more things will be cut during the day. So good things, let's promote. Let's observe them. Let's share. I think that's going to happen. And action it. Yes. I think that's very, very important. Small action. One thing which is coming to my mind is community service. Make things part of community service. I think that will spread the message. That will integrate. Actually, Mayur, uh, when the earthquakes happened in Turkey, even though various countries reached out, I've been in Turkey for four and a half years and worked with the ambassadors. And, um, the first responders were the people, the community, that came together and helped each other before the governments could send uh, rescue and support. And the saddest part was heartbreaking to see that there were people under the debris and they could not be removed from that and they died of starvation. That's the sad one. But the good one is the picture that you would have all seen on Instagram and social media where a three-year-old boy was rescued by a rescue worker. And the joy it gave, not only because he smiled at them, but the joy and energy it gave to the team to put in those additional hours is reinstating the humanity in us. That, you know, even a child can have that effect on you. And there's a beautiful story that Karen has about a kid in, in a prison, and I hope you can share that. And the same, same in yes. 2001, the place, the state which I live, yeah. the same thing happened. Humanity came together to rescue them. Yes, yes. So many times, I think it's not just government. Mm -hmm. I think it's people. It's, it's the people. And uh, having lived in Mumbai, where we've had so many bomb blasts and everything else, it's always been the people that have rescued each other, the re resilience of the spirit to stand up again. Kern's wanting to say something so hard. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to um, Simone. Um, and a lot of you say, well, we need a structure. I, I, I came into the psychological world 20 years ago and studied human consciousness. Um, you could say I'm an expert in that particular field. We do something called neuroplastic acceleration and we do it at the university. We take leaders, as Simone talked about, and we talk to them and say, okay, we can upgrade your thinking, get you to be more empathetic, get you to be more progressive, get you more ideas, get you more innovation. We phone leaders all around the world, all the time. We have an uptake of more than, or less than, minus one percent. That is the level of world we live in, where people do not want to grow. Whereas the average person, you go to them working in an organization, they have ideas, they have innovative ideas. We talk to these people too, and they say to us, I went to the leadership of my organization, NHS, big organizations, Microsoft, with an idea, I had lots of ideas, and they said, we don't pay you for ideas, go and do your job. <laughs> we live in a world like that, where the current leadership in organ organizations, whether it's political, whether it's economic, whether it's um, corporate, they want to sandbag their situation, and want to go for their gold courses, and they want to go for what their, 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 their bonuses, and all the bullshit that they come out with, and they don't like other people with ideas coming forward. Coming back to a particular thing about hope, we have two extremes here, and they're both equally guilty in the problem that we lie in. One is we have extreme empaths, and we other have extreme psychopaths. The extreme psychopaths are very good at running organizations. That's how they get there, because they couldn't give a fuck about who they sacked or who they walked over. It's profits over people. And once we understand that, that's where the world's going. The extreme empath is equally guilty, because it just comes and says, we need to love each other. We need to cover each other. We need a bit of kindness here. And we need, no one's got any ideas, no one's got any strategies we need to love. I'm going to say to the extreme empath that you are the reason the psychopath laughs in your face, and laughs in everybody's face and makes the money that they do, and has all the power. You cause the problem. It's not that the psychopaths are the problem, it's the empaths, because they haven't got the capacity to stand up and go, let's stop cuddling, let's do something. For 20 years, I've been talking to empaths that couldn't work together. The coaching world is totally Example, a, a, a total example of this. We talk to coaches all over the world. They're so self-serving, sycophantic. They want to heal themselves by trying to heal the world and other people. They cannot work together. Psychopaths are very good at running military. Very good at running organisations where they can get people who are unconscious to work for them by telling them a narrative. And something that Simona mentioned about an organisation from Israel that were ex-military that were trying to make a difference because they they were feeling bad about what they'd done. Breaking the silence, Israel. 
So we're living in a world of illusion, disillusionment, misinformation, disinformation. It's very confusing for your minds to be able to get through that. And it's much better to sit back and go, oh, it's all too much. And I'll do my little thing. But we're at a point of question, just as these gentlemen said, we're at a point of end of days. And you have to get passionate. And you have to get that look in your eye that says, I'm going to war. It's a war of consciousness. It's a war of the mind space. And you guys are ones who are guilty of letting what happens happen. Because it is the current leadership. And unless you address that and you stop doing the little bits and pieces of kindness, you just get walked over. And now, I've been having this conversation for many, many years. And I get nowhere. And that makes a bit of frustration. But I'm passionate about change on this planet. I'm passionate about humanity. And I'm passionate about saving the people that are getting hurt. People I heard about last night. Little children, girls running to prostitution. This is the same sickness. We can do something about it. And there is a mechanism we can do it. We've been running it for 20 years. If you guys want to get involved in that, it means change, it means revolution, and it means taking the fight to people and using your mouth, not guns. If I could just add, hello, Fire in London. So thank you, panelists, this has been an engaging conversation. We've talked today about dinosaurs, and I quote, pissing up walls. Now, one thing very important, we're talking about action. My question to the panelists, is there enough accountability? Where is the accountability? And what measures would you implement to put accountability to governments and organizations and communities? <clears throat> Very, very valid question because uh, one individual responsibility, collective responsibility, and accountability. This is the biggest problem in conferences where we all talk ideas. And as I was just saying, once the conference is over, people leave the room, the subject is left in the room. So when Khan was talking about change, and Simone was talking about her inputs, and Jennifer was talking about vision. I think we should not let this subject be left in this room. We should come together and, you know, have our say, ask the difficult questions, and ask the ones who are responsible, but let's be honest, the leaders that are elected are elected as a majority from their country and they're doing what they're doing. And it's not an easy job to replace them with the ones who really want to bring change because not so many people are supporting them, they're the minority. So we also have to do a reality check when we come to the fact of accountability. And I just gave the example of Malala, who's in the space of educating girl child. And we know what's happened recently uh, in Iran. And we know the schools that have been closed and everything else. And her, her was one liner. Where are we in the last five years? Exactly where she was standing on the podium speaking. So there's no sense in you know, discussing that because she wanted accountability. And like her, there are many, like Greta, who's in the space of climate uh, crisis. And you know, she gets arrested all the time. And, and she's a young child uh, who's out of university, but she's so passionate about what she's doing. So the individual has to be supported by a collective unit as, as we've been having this conversation. And we've had some great insights from Kern, and we've had some stuff of expression from Ord, which is art, and Jennifer added in her part. And I think, yes, art is an expression. It's an expression of pain. I come from a country which is India. There are some Indians here. And we know some reality checks stuff that is happening in our country. And I shared with Gurn about two projects that I'm very passionate about and hopeful that those people's message and life can come to light. The largest slum in Asia is Mumbai, which is Tharabi. Everybody passes Tharabi. Does anybody go inside Tharabi when you enter Mumbai to see the condition of living? And the second biggest red light area in Asia is called Kumatipura, out of which 95% women are HIV. These are children who are kidnapped from their homes or sold by parents who have the money to feed their other children. We're talking that reality on one side of the world. And for them to get a hope to go to a school is like having prayed to God 
And finally, he listened to your prayer, so. Yeah, um, hello, um, my name's Sean, I'm from Australia. Um, Hi, Sean. Thank you for the panel, really interesting insights and grabbed a lot of really good ideas and I was sort of hopeful in some sort of way this panel wouldn't be all about fluffy hope. And that's one thing so I'm really glad to hear and see that perspective. So we'll all make some uh, minutes special on <coughs> um, boards uh, mentioning on art. I think that's I think that's fundamental. I think art has been disregarded too much in terms of the leadership and the learning. Um, got particular history, I think, as well. Um, but what was it art as a tangible learning exercise and constraints and living in beauty and minimalism? Um, so I wouldn't mind having that discussion with you later on. Kern, your, your discussion is really sort of, yes. the points really struck at me is um, you mentioned about education, and it's one thing that um, it reminded me of Ken Robinson's um, point on how we get five year old kids and put them into a system and decreate them. Um, and any innovation expert I speak to, they'll say they'd rather speak to a five-year-old than a 55-year-old on ideas. And I think it was Albert Keynes who said the history of humanity is the history of ideas. So I think any action that I'll, and I'm certainly trying to work on that, is, is how to revolutionise the education system. And so, and what I'm hearing about here and here is that, yeah, we, we, we recognise beliefs have failed, um, and it's probably impossible to change, but what can change is bottom up. Um, and I think that's where the community mentioned the community over here was, was mentioned and how you create community action. Uh, to our history, um, the Agoras of the Greek cities used to bring in ideas and bring people from communities to, to you know, discuss that sort of thing. And, but that slowly went away. Um, and even in Australia, uh, our first cities were designed in such a way to stop that discussion from happening. So we need to bring that discussion back, bring it back to the bottom level and bring those ideas bottom up. So, yeah, I just want to share that. Just one point on that. If you go back two and a half thousand years by you think of Socrates, I mean, what happened to him? He was a guy that used Socratic argument to question the officials. He didn't take a position and argue it. He just asked them to defend their position. We talk about accountability. Accountability. You're never going to get accountability when the system's rigged. They're just going to sit in front of you and fluff it to you, and you've got all the money and all the wealth, and it would switch <coughs> the bottle barons through the, the, the media. So you, you're up against a whole system where you can't see the truth, and you will never get truth from people who run it and have all the money. It's impossible because they own the accountants in the first place. They probably rig votes. I don't know about that. That might be a serious thing to say. But when we're looking at what we're doing to the children, if you want to really stand up, save the children. The children, even Einstein said, he said, you don't want to go to school because you go into the rote learning system, you come out with zero creativity, and psychologically the bottom line. If you want to save your children from that, start doing something about the education system that doesn't want to do anything, because it's part of the system to get people to not think, so they will follow the leaders that make the money. It's a whole ecosystem. Even someone goes into a government with the best of intentions, they get faced with a system that is fully entrenched for years that will not change. It's geared up from the, the difference in the, 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 the education system. So if you're going to do anything, do it for the children, do it for the future. The planet's going to be here whatever. Honestly, the planet could care less about us. It's a big rock floating through un in the universe. It doesn't care. The only thing that gives something value is us. We give value. It's our hearts, our love of each other. When we stand by and watch the world go down the tubes, and it's on the TV, it's on CNN, which is obviously a politically um, uh, orientated channel, and we try to, we believe this crap. The only thing that we can believe in is ourselves, our capacity to grow, our capacity to care and take action together and start to realise that the current system is defunct in every net opportunity. And the new system, which is artificial general intelligence consciousness, <coughs> will come in and it will ask us why we stood by with all the suffering that goes on and we will not have an answer. We will say, I did my little bit, but it wasn't big enough. Too many people died while you were doing a little bit. We need to do the big bit now. And as all said, we're at the end of days, we're at that last minute. <coughs> this is our chance, our back is against the wall. It's where we stand, where we fall as a race and we will become extinct if we do not stand. I'll tell you that now. I've been in this business for a long period of time, and I can tell you each and every one of you has the capacity within your mind to solve every problem on this planet yourself. You do not need leadership, you do not need military, you do not need police, 
you just need a basic foundation of a five-year-old, and that will solve every problem that you've got. Just very briefly, thank you. Um, when I refer to art, I don't mean, uh, sorry, when I refer to art, I just don't mean pictorial art. I include writing, of course. And I think why it is so important is a way of communication and a way of, con of conveying our ideas, good art is. And going back to the original, I think what you mentioned, the community spirit of a pre prehistoric art, cave art was there to communicate to other members of the tribe, so to speak, what to do uh, with animals and so on. So it is a very, I think there's a biological function in art anyway. And uh, art, I don't want people to think of airy fairy art. It's a very important uh, means of communication across language and across everything. Thank you. It's needed to us. My name is Oliver. I'm um, an entrepreneur of finance in, in Germany. Uh, Listening to all these different positions and stating and we're searching for vision and joint vision and doing things together and uh, the state of the world where we are right now. Um, actually, I want to advocate something different. I think um, the world might be as bad as you state. Like it's time is over. Um, there's only one solution. Um, free your minds. Um, but. Shouldn't it be rather more than being tolerant to multi-visions, to many ideas, to the openness of visions, to the concurrence of, of different ideas? And isn't that rather the point than going into just one problem-solving solution? I think, just, just let, let me get that to the end. Um, one problem solution um, is always the source of, of a lot of trouble. And what happens if we, if we had, had been wrong? going actionable to, to um, our situation here. I fully agree. We give the value. And everybody, each and everybody of us in this conference, in fact, we are specialists in, in, in what we are doing. And we are taking this idea out and doing in the things that we do well that brought us here to the conference. Yeah. We can do change, even though if we keep in our um, existing way of thinking, we, we can develop, we can move forward. And we can bring that out and we can continue with the change and even take more hope because hope, which is the core here, is not um, that uh, it's hopeless, there's no, no chance anymore, but even though that the situation may be as fucked up as, as it is, yeah. hope is what keeps you alive. Keeps us going on. Yes, exactly. And doing what we can. And I think as a community, I'm going to take everyone's numbers because the next time we can be together, we want to actually, the lady is left, but say we've done some actionable things together. And we have to wrap up, so I, I, I'll take Jennifer. Jennifer wanted to say something, and then we'll just wrap up with our round of the panelists. Yeah, just taking out the point about a shift in consciousness. You know, there are many different frameworks we can use. I don't think any one what anyone has a monopoly on the right way in psychology we talk about shifting from fight and flight to rest and digest there are many different frameworks we can use but it's undoubtedly the case that we need to make that shift but i think we have to move away from talk of conflict of binaries of othering you know those of us who think we are right create walls as high as the one that Trump wanted to build when we other others we have to start talking in a different place and just to give a, a last quote from Rumi, out beyond talk of right and wrongdoing, there is a field and I will meet you there and it is there that we need to be having these conversations. There isn't room for a you don't do things right accusing others. It has to come from a place of non-accusation from pure conscious desire I to solve agree humanity's more. problems. I couldn't agree more because I think the bridges that connect us are stronger than the walls that divide us. And so the wrap-up statement, we have some poetry, uh, some music, um, and hopefully some closing statements from our panelists. So, sorry. Uh, having heard everybody, what I want to quote is basically is uh, something from Hinduism. Destruction is an opportunity to rebuild. The fact that I come from, we worship destruction. Because this is when you rebuild. We are already, we have already destroyed the world as we know it and we have already destroyed it. This is our time to rebuild basically. 
So in my book, mm -hmm. capacity, and in very small capacity, but what I want, uh, sorry, yeah. What I'm doing personally is, is to invest in things like, for instance, there's a technology that can make water out of thin air. Imagine in refugee, refugee camps where there's no water access. Imagine having sustainable construction so that when there are earthquakes, there's not these piles and piles of bricks falling over each other. So these are the things. Technology has destroyed us. It is a tool we should use to rebuild us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Thank you. And actually, I hear all the thoughts. Uh, the reality that we are living in today's world that mostly in our world there is no justice, there is no prosperity. <coughs> we should try and at our personal capacity that we have to bring justice and accountability in our world. And if we're looking to find the right people to bring down at the global level, I think it's going to be tough because the global and the political leadership, they are completely engaged in a dirty political games. That is not for the ultimate benefit of the human being. By saying that one, I would like to quote a point from Mavlana, very short one. Then I have another quite long one, but please give me. Uh, sure, sure, please. We already had one room in which was spectacular. Yeah. Go ahead. We were saying that. So when he says Mevlana, he means Jalaluddin Rumi. Rumi. Yeah, yes. from Konya. Yeah. I read it in Persian, the same tone that I will translate. Please go ahead. Mawlana is saying that the Shaykh Bajra Hamegash Gir the Shaykh Kazdi Udak Malula Mo and Sana Marzos. Mawlana is saying that there was a Shaykh who was looking around the city with a lamp on the hand. Uh, Bored of devil and death, looking and hoping for human. Guft an yaf me nashavat justayim ma, guft an ki yaf me nashavat ana ma zos. He was told that you cannot find whatever you're looking for, and he replied that I'm hopeful to find the one that cannot be found. Now, this second poem that I'm going to uh, read it. This is from another uh, poet that is called Mahdi Joani. This is for the hope. So we cannot fix the issues which is we're looking for. So what we have to do, we have to start by giving a good hope for ourselves. We have to make ourselves a release from the trap that either ourselves or the other human being has created for us. Saying that, Azad shavaz band khish zanjir ra bawar makan. Ukrun zaman zindagi stakhir ra bawar makan. The translation is, make yourself free from your own trap and don't believe in chains. Now and today is the time to live good. Don't believe in delays. Start today and don't postpone it to tomorrow. Har fas hayahu kam bezan as ashti ha dam bezan. از دشمنی پرهیز کن شمشیر را باور مکن. Don't talk more about the chaos. Talk more on the consolation. Avoid from the enmity and don't trust the sword. خود را ضعیف و کم ندان تنها در این عالم ندان تو شاهکار خالقی تحقیر را باور مکن. Do not consider yourself weak and low. And don't feel alone in the world. You are a creative masterpiece of God, so don't believe in humiliation. Bar roy baam zindagi har chiz me khahi bikash. Bar roy baam zindagi har chiz me khahi bikash. Zeba wa zishtash paye tuz taqdeer ra baawar makam. Draw whatever you wish on the canvas of your life. It's up to you. Beautiful and ugly the picture is on your feet. Don't believe in faith. Tasweer agar zeba na bud na qash khub neisti. Tasweer agar zeba na bud na qash khub neisti. As now the bara rasm kon tasweer ra bawar makar. If the picture is not beautiful at the end, it's because you're not a good artist. So redraw. Again and again, and don't believe in the picture. The last verse. 
خالد تو را شاد آفرید آزاد آزاد آفرید خالد تو را شاد آفرید آزاد آزاد آفرید پرواز کن تا آرزو زنجیر را باور مکن You should know that the Creator has created you happy and free So fly high to reach your hopes and don't believe in impossible That was absolutely brilliant, Zabula. Thank you. I might start with a quote from the Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, who wrote, um, the philosopher's task is collecting memories with a purpose. And Wittgenstein wrote this in his philosophical investigations, where he quite extensively tries to show that our language, the way we talk, cannot be defined with absolute clarity. Our language is messy, our language is complicated, and every time we communicate, there is no way we can actually, with 100% clarity, specify what we mean. But, while we tried in his early life to create a logical, more clarity of language, in his later work, the philosophical investigations, he argued, maybe that is okay. Maybe as long as we understand each other, but the messiness, the complicatedness is fine. I understand the way. And maybe it's the same when it comes to hope, when it comes to change. Um, whenever all of us, when we try to make a better world, we likely won't have a clear goal in mind, we won't have the perfect plan. So it will be messy, it will be complicated like the world is. But as long as you learn, as long as you collect memories with a purpose, maybe that's all you need, maybe that's all it has to be. Thank you, Michael. That's, yeah, That's wonderful. Yeah, cool. When I first started talking, I said I'd upset you because you're the egocentric identity. Um, and what we do, um, we fuse neuroscience, how your brain works, how it works, how it's developed, how it's been influenced, the spirituality. And that's a very important part of the development of the human spirit. Some people are atheists, they don't believe in anything. But when you start to enter into the more spiritual world, the metaphysical world, the quantum physical world, you realize that there is a greater mechanism at work all the time. And it's our connection with that that we, the ascension path takes you towards. We're using the current thinking. But I said at the beginning, it's the current thinking that is the problem. We're all egocentrically moving, from, always staying within our current thinking and defending that position. When I train people and what we train them people in, we challenge their, their absolute perception of reality to the very core. And that means it's quite a dis uncomfortable position to go in. And it only takes those who are prepared to open their minds to their true potential to be able to work with. That's the very full potential of humanity. There is a huge hope for the future. I see it in every person I speak to every day, whether it's the smallest child or the oldest person. They have such wisdom, such beauty, and such love that that is something that we should try to nurture. We, we turn our backs on pain sometimes, look away the other way. We turn our backs on death, look away the other way. Look, like, look, look the other way for old people. Everybody that might upset our little bubble. But if we can face ourselves in the mirror and see who we truly are, and try to accept that we can be massively more than we currently are, then we go on that ascension path and it is one that never ends and it just gets open and open and open and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and the world's problems just drift away and you start to see the world as a very beautiful place. And as Nishan, the Buddhist monk from the 13th to 14th century once said that um, heaven is here on earth right now. We just can't see it because the bandwidth and frequency of our thought is not capable of doing so. The future is a point of telepathy for us. We're moving into that. We might all notice that we're starting to find that we can kind of sense each other's thoughts. We can kind of feel there's something else going on. We're in a shift of consciousness. It's just a question of how fast we want to run with it. But thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I didn't upset too many people. <laughs> thank you. Karen? Yes. Um,
seeing a child that's in the rubble and you can't help them. I think that's, that's crazy and emotional. And I think also frustrating is that every day there are children in rubble that we can't help. And we see this in the prisons too. Children in prisons who, I've met so many prisons and you will, I've met so many kids and you won't believe that they're actually in there for stealing a Coke and blanket. Place after place after place. So today, really in countries throughout the world, people are, are arbitrarily detained and tortured. And I think we need to take action to support those who have hope, who will move forward in action, the strategy and vision. You asked me to share the story, so I'd love to share the story about a child in prison who actually is the inspiration behind starting International Bridges to Justice. So he was a four-year-old boy who was born in a Cambodian prison because his mother committed a crime. And so he was a little baby when he was born, so he was able to, as he got bigger, um, have access, the guards liked him, so he got access in and out. So he could climb in and out in between the bars. And by the time I met him, his head was getting bigger, so he'd have to climb into the bars, so like the first, the second, and then the third bar. And he would slowly like sort of move his head, because he had to get through the bars, and then go down three, two, one. But the reason he wanted to go down is because every day he wanted to come and take my little pinky. I lived in Cambodia working in prisons for a number of years. And he wanted to take my pinky so that we could go together. And he could stick his little finger through to say hello to the prisoners. Or there were some prisons, prison cells where he couldn't go through. And he would be able to like carve through the dirt and put his fingers through. And we know many of the prisoners said that for them, he was their greatest hope and inspiration and sunshine. And he's our inspiration because we realized that he was like, hey, Maybe he's a four-year-old kid who is born without power without much, but he was like, you know what? I'm, I'm one, but I can do something. So I'm gonna do the one thing that I can do. And today there are really courageous defenders throughout the world who are in the network supporting people who are accused of crimes. And I know a lot of people go, we don't want support people who are accused of crimes, but if you are looking at any inequality, any vulnerability, you go to any prison and open that prison gate and you will see exactly who you can the most vulnerable, people who are criminalized for poverty, for, for, for gender, for, for everything that you can think of. So support the defenders, support who they are. Their poem, which we say in all of our trainings, is take courage, friends. The road is often long, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. But deep down, there is another truth. You are not alone. So I hope you will join the defenders also and support them in the work they do in fighting them. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Mark. We're wrapping up statement more now. Looking forward to that one. I'm not too sure. But uh, firstly, I think what we do is admirable. And um, I think it's uh, based on lived experience, which I think is the essence of any uh, good creative work of art. And when you talk, you talked about beauty in the poem, I think uh, there's a great difficulty in understanding that, which is, I use the quote from John Keats, beauty is truth, and truth is beauty, and that's all we need to know. But just going back to, again, what you said, I think my, my field is Cubism, and uh, I believe what happened in the 1900s was a great turning point in human consciousness. We had, uh, in science, Einstein's theories of relativity, in literature, in music, uh, much changes, and I don't think these have really filtered through to our understanding of what changed in the world. And uh, certainly Cubism tries to uh, show what we know about things, not what we see, and so therefore multiple uh, visions. I, I really don't know what the answer is. I think there are lots of uh, issues that have been raised here that are very meaningful and hope not hopeful, but constructive perhaps in reality. But I still believe that uh, the only way we can uh, change majorly is by uh, a vision, an art vision, or something that can make people connect and communicate and understand, mostly empathize to, but not hope. Thank you, Art, and I'd like to wrap it up. I'll just say something, just want to say thank you uh, for you bring this together and the work that you did with us guys. It was a super a moderator, probably the best I've ever, I might give you a round of applause on this if we could all do that, because she's been fantastic. <laughs> I'm going to get emotional by saying this, we are all human first.
and you know the African philosophy says Kuntu, I am because you are. And the Indian philosophy says Vasudeva Kutambakam, one world, one family. So I want to play a song because at the end of the day we just need a friend who cares. And if we look at each other with the eyes of love and friendship, I think half of the problems will go in the sense that there will be comfort and you will know, as she rightly said, you are not alone. So please allow me to play this song. It's in Hindi. It's been specially composed for our reconstructing home. How did you 
Turkish? Yes, both. Uh -huh. But I told you that Bakhtar okay. is stronger than you. That's what we should have done is had all the Baka body here. I will I will ring the bell once more okay. and then the bell start because we have two parts of the time they're going to help you. Yeah. And then we have some microphone. If you like, I can make an announcement in Japanese. Tell people, tell people they can bring your food. I don't care. Thank you. It's not allowed to bring your food. That's the problem. I'm a big fan of working lunch. Yeah, I agree. Especially if you're an hour of Yeah. And I need to be closer. Really? You brought your phone? Oh, to close. But it's not just touching it. Really? Oh, come on. It's not going anywhere. I hope it's three falls. Can you give me a Yeah, that would be Let's start the session. Um, maybe we should we close the door a tiny bit? Yes. So I would like to give a warm welcome to. Oh, very nice. Our last panelist. We're complete. But then you understand why the others are not So, uh, no, we waited for you. We've been waiting for you. Did you have a Yes, 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 perfect, perfect. Oh, yeah, no, I think if you would like to go. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, 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 please. So, a uh, warm welcome to the panelists and also uh, to the organizer of this very beautiful event here. Um, very much appreciated. And also, um, the other people who are joining our panel uh, and decided uh, to come here instead of having food. So thank you very much for that. I'm uh, Hannah Frock. I'm uh, co-founder and CSO of Bentu, and I'm your last minute chair. Hooray! <laughs> so a small intro to the topic. So welcome to the session, technology for, for the betterment of humanity. So technology inventions had and have a huge impact on society, economy, and environment. And if we recall a little bit the past, we have in 1784, the first mechanization starting with the steam power. Think about the impact this had on society. 1870, assembly lines and mass production were established. 1969, automation and electronics. And 2011, cyber physical systems and networks. And now, JetGPT, AI. And where do we stand today? What will happen next? Technology can be used for good and or worse. What are the best technologies to create a positive impact in our world? How can we achieve the SDGs? How can we ensure financing for the best technologies? What are the risks of new invention, new technologies? So in this session, we will touch many challenging topics within one topic. So I see this panel as an opening for the discussion, which will be continued in the one or the other session following today and tomorrow. So I would like to start the session by a short introduction from each panelist. Um, so a brief introduction for yourself, your business, <coughs> and please tell us what do you think is the next biggest challenge that lies ahead of humanity. So I will kick, kick off this session. Um, as I was supposed to be a panelist, <laughs> so just for a second, I take the stage to introduce myself and uh, hopefully uh, engage the communication in our panel. So I'm Hannah Prock. I'm currently co-founder and CSO of Plan Group. It's a tech company, and I believe that the next greatest challenge for humanity is climate change 
and food security for the growing population. That was also the reason why I left my marine science career and became a full-time entrepreneur in 2017. So the aim was to build a hopefully very profitable business, but also with an intense focus of positive impact. So Plan Blue is automating high detailed sea maps, monitoring and visualizing the health of the seafloor and the ocean above, pollution, biodiversity, and also carbon sequestration potential. So why is this data important? And I'll bring you an example. We can enable blue carbon projects. That means that we can monetize the seafloor and help finance uh, help finance um, conservation. So why is that the case? I would like to bring you another example because it's not very, a lot of people are not very aware how much the ocean can contribute. The seafloor can fix up to 35 times more efficient CO2 than any land-based plant. We have really large areas where the ecosystems were destroyed. If we restore it, we can fix meaningful amounts of CO2. We are also in other spaces. So sustainable resource management will be a key coastal for coastal protection, but also underwater construction. I leave it to that, and I'm very happy to come to the next panelist, or the first, if I don't count myself in. <laughs> Uh, Shina. Shina, right? Not Kina. Shina. Shina, yeah. Shina, sorry. No, I'm sorry, because there was a room with minister, so I jumped over there, but I wrote the email to all of you, actually. Uh, uh, anyway, okay, now we are stuck. Now, my name is Shina, and, um, you know, I, I, I graduated from Istanbul from German high school and in Berlin. And does engineering, I went to New York, MBA, and then business school, and then I started to work as a management consultant in New York, and then moved to Frankfurt. I did it for almost six years, and then I started my own company doing the same thing on my own. So I did it 17 years, 18 years, just for six clients. And with 50, I made a life decision. We were sitting in our summer house in Odro. I read an article written by my former colleagues, the kids, the power of solar economics. <coughs> and I went to my small group of team and said, look, there are no more, it was 2008, not a coincidence, no more uh, doing consulting for banks. Anyway, almost, uh, so we will focus on solar space. Uh, and then we started solar. So I was one of the early movers. And, uh, you know, we started with two Turkish groups. We were successful. We were the number one in the first tender. And uh, got 15% of the tender capacity and saved. Spent five million dollars on day one for the license owners, including us and the families. <coughs> Based upon that, the Finnish company Fortum came to us. We did the same joint business model with the JV company Fortum and the same with Sunpark. So they all found us. Of course, my partner, which in 2008 was a very, very small EPC company. They became world market leader 2011 2013, so this was, of course, very helpful for the Turkish operations. But unfortunately, I didn't mention that to the minister um, because, you know, the whole potential of what he was describing us was great, right? Uh, but but if, imagine if we would have a rather democratic structures then that potential would be 
explode. Huh? I mean, I mean he, he made a very good picture of us in uh, Turkey, which is, which is great. Um, anyway, um, so, so um, these two companies came and, and we developed projects, but unfortunately we bought their shares at the symbolic dump, uh, amount and gave them call options, but the call options expired. Okay, what do we do now with these projects? This is now our current uh, focus. I will skip some of the focuses and I will focus on green hydrogen and green ammonia. We have solar power plants. I mean, we build, it's just project planning, right? Project development. We know we secure the land and, 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 and we produce green hydrogen. But we don't have the pipelines. So what do we do? We do decentral in the region, we produce green ammonia and turn it into green fertilizer and, and use it at this locality uh, to, to do value-added agriculture. So the major problem uh, I see is similar to my peers, climate change, we have to fight it, and I think you know, with green hydrogen and green ammonia, we are in the right track building a new base for uh, solar complex. So that's my first point. Am I, am I on time? <laughs> no. <laughs> we have to move on to the next person. <laughs> no, it's well, very nice. Um, it's so uh, very nice what you built. Um, Ayala. Um, Please, could you introduce yourself? Thank you. Imilos, I am the CEO and co-founder of Imilo Sciences. Imilo Sciences is a preclinical stage biotech company developing cardiometabolic and heart failure drugs or therapies based on utilizing a precision medicine approach. This approach is uh, depend upon a technology we have developed and pioneered. Uh, we call them a Concordia platform. Uh, we utilize three-dimensional uh, patient-drive tissues, and that means the cardiac tissues, and integrate it with the AI-based diagnostic tools to be able to do the stratification. So I mean, in a layman manner, we are able to match the subpopulations to the drug if the for example, heart failure preserved ejection fraction foundation. There is a 500 different categories. Our technology is able to find the right group of patients to bring the clinical trials that not only increase the effectiveness of the clinical trials, but also lower the cost of clinical trials for heart failure. And we are enabling technology for the precision medicine. And uh, the why why we are doing what we are doing and what is the importance of that uh, it's very clear to me because heart failure or heart disease is still number one in the global level and it's both affecting men and women and a very limited innovation has been in the heart failure or the cardiac disease area and uh, our company and our technology is determined to change that if something is number one is uh, killing the humanity, we would like to be able to see more innovation in this space. And uh, there are many reasons why it's not happening, why precision medicine is not there. And one reason that why precision medicine hasn't been in the heart area, it's very difficult to take a piece from your heart and match the drug to that. But right now, enabling technologies like ours is enabling uh, the doctors and also drug developers to be able to take the blood or urine sample and create your heart outside and with the certification ability, you can look into the subcategories of the population. Uh, one drug for all people or around the world is not working and it's not effective, but still is in the model and only five or six drugs for everybody has to change. It's time to come and technologies are here and uh, myself uh, has been committed to that as a mission. I lost my own father 34 years ago to a heart failure, and his condition still has no drug availability. So hopefully, with what I initiated, we will be able to change it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sam. Oh. Hello. Go ahead. 
I'm Sam. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Level X. I've spent my career in the video games industry at companies like Lucasfilm, making Star Wars games, Microsoft. Uh, I've built and sold a few video game companies. My company, Level X, makes video games for doctors. So imagine three million people, including a million medical professionals, earning continuing education credit toward renewing their medical license from playing video games, where you do difficult surgeries on complex patients, where you play puzzle games, where you learn how to diagnose rare disease, or how to recognize skin disease on skin of color, or how to manage an ultrasound, or how to manage a ventilator. Uh, we work with most of the top med device and life science companies, as well as major medical societies and NASA, to accelerate the adoption curve of new techniques, new treatments in healthcare, uh, and we do it using the neuroscience and the technology of video games. Um, so, look, in terms of the biggest problem I think we face in the next 10 years, it's you know whether AI takes us towards the utopian or dystopian direction. I won't talk about that. We'll talk about that later. Um, I think what I'll, what I'll say here is, you know, the, the problem that we're solving in the long term is if you think about it, there's a new treatment or there's a new device that comes into healthcare, it can be years, it can be decades until that becomes the standard of care. And it's not because doctors are slow and it's not because they're Luddites. It's because the only methods that we give them to train and learn on those new techniques is by practicing on live human beings. And this doesn't scale, and this is one of the reasons why new innovation dissipates very slowly into medicine and even more slowly into underserved communities. There are massive gaps. Uh, there are major racial disparities in healthcare, major economic disparities in healthcare. Technology has a tendency, it seems, to exacerbate those disparities instead of resolving them. I fundamentally believe that we can use technology to reduce racial economic disparities in healthcare, starting with making a medical, high quality medical education free, teaching you how to use the latest devices and making it available worldwide. Thank you very much. <laughs> Darius, would you like to take it from here? With great pleasure. <clears throat> so thank you very much. So actually we've got very similar model of working actually work in the medical sector, we work in the aviation sector, and the uh, main idea uh, of our uh, business is to provide services we believe in the and uh, quite good to the uh, aviation sector, but not to the like, uh, aviation, uh, meaning the uh, pilots and uh, planes operator, just to run service. Uh, just simple, simple, very simple example, just to give you a uh, the picture of that what we do. For example, we put the airport uh, fire brigade. So fire brigade should like train uh, every six months, perform some training and so on. So we decided to move the training from the reality up to the artificial intelligence and augmented reality. So how do we do that? For example, we copy the airport we are in the Gazantep, we copy the airport in the Gazantep, we build it up in the artificial intelligence so the Gazantep airport doesn't have to be closed up like for a uh, half a day just to fire brigade have a uh, being trained, yeah. So they do everything what they should do, uh, actually in virtual reality. So it's like great uh, cost reduction for uh, airport. Like very very medium airport may just save around one million euro yearly concerning those trains. So it's, it's quite good, I think, just for for a smaller and medium uh, airports. And of course, we provide very similar services not only for fire brigades but also for the entire staff working and handling that. Uh, grant services like uh, security services like uh, handling the luggage and so on. So we just concentrate on that and try to provide very, very innovative uh, solutions just to make the uh, work they work less complex and just reduce the cost. So what's the, what's the biggest challenge? Because that was the uh, part of the question. I think that the biggest challenge in the nearest future is the quite good quality of uh, supervision of the machine learning because it's going to be uh, like kind of problem because uh, we've got a feeling right now sometimes not very often that also uh, artificial intelligence is a very good source of manipulation and also we believe that we are manipulated not only by people but sometimes by algorithms and sometimes uh, also we get to think about that that uh, machine learning uh, which is a driver of for example, ChatGPT also is fed with the information that we provide, and uh, it's like quite complex. We have to also try to assess the results 
that we receive. Because when we uh, just compare the way the human being thinks, and uh, uh, for example, chat, chat GPT is quite different. Can you just imagine a human being just being fed with the information without being given any real experience, without emotion, without senses, and so on? That's the way that chat GPT and artificial intelligence work. So we've got like, for example, 30 year old person just basing mainly or in 100% on the information given by somebody. That's also the question we're talking about the risk of the artificial intelligence and machine, uh, machine uh, learning. So it's quite, it's quite different. Let's and not go ahead. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and the entire process, process uh, that is taking place must be supervised and we must as well learn how to supervise and we must learn how to teach machine learning and artificial intelligence what to do and the way the method it's, it's been doing. So that's, that's it for the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm uh, looking for the time here, don't worry. Now, all good. Uh, we can uh, continue with Mathieu. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Mathieu Graham. I live in Belgium with my two kids and my wife. And you call me uh, positively obsessed with human development. So I uh, evolved from uh, optimizing performance of Olympic athletes into co-founding um, a business called QLX, creating quality of life experience in which we basically help people to wake up, in which we make people aware, self-aware, in which we make people viscerally understand, which is very different from knowing, we make them understand and apply fundamental principles of human development. Because what you understand, you control. What you don't understand or what you're not aware of controls you. Right? So to move from knowing to understanding, people need experience. Otherwise, it remains in your cognitive sphere. You just know it, but you don't understand it. So we need experience. So we are merging technology, science, and creativity about those fundamental principles and we move them into transformative experiences exactly to move from knowing to understanding and as such we make on-site online experiences up to premium coaching by a whole team of world class experts um, and it is because of this understanding uh, issue that I think for me the biggest issue or challenge for humanity will be to wake up will be to use technology at their service and not function at service of technology. And that is, in my opinion, only uh, feasible if you become aware of yourself in the first place. Thank you very much. Uh, check with you. Well, good afternoon and uh, thank you, Hannah, for leading us uh, in this session. Uh, my name is Jeff Steiner. I'm visiting uh, from Toronto, Canada. I wear several hats that are relevant, I guess, to today's panel. Uh, I would say three. Uh, the one on my head, I wear lots of hats because I'm a bit balding. But uh, also two uh, hats today. One is I serve as uh, president of something called Angel Investors Ontario, and that is a regional umbrella group that coordinates uh, angel groups that invest in startups in the province of Ontario. Toronto is the uh, largest city, but there are 10 or 12 cities uh, in the province of Ontario. So Angel Investors Ontario, AIO, is part of what I do. The second one is I'm one of the founders of Canada's a new uh, development finance institution, a DFI. Uh, for some bizarre reason, Canada uh, didn't have a development finance institution until about four years ago. I was one of the founding directors, and we decided to make the focus of that DFI, which is called FinDev Canada, we decided to make it um, focused on gender lens investing, so empowering women entrepreneurs, uh, as well as some community economic development. This is picking a couple, two or three only, of the SDGs, of the 17 SDGs. So from a private sector, point of view, Angel Investors Ontario looking at technologies and startups that of course are profitable, but many uh, investments of course have uh, contributions uh, to humanity. Uh, within the context of the other organization, FinDev Canada, 
by definition, it is to be uh, impactful, uh, socially impactful, but also, of course, profit-making, even though it's a government DFI. Uh, it's about deploying private sector and mobilizing private sector. I would finish just with uh, a couple thoughts. Um, as we look over the portfolio of investments that our angels make, or even this development finance institution DFI makes, um, some you can be quite sure uh, are a <coughs> contributor to uh, you know, positive humanity <coughs> with no questions asked about whether there's some downside. Examples would be medical devices, uh, investments in medical treatments. You don't really need to worry about is there an unintended consequence. Other investments, self-driving vehicles, everyone's excited about self-driving vehicles, but what is the impact on drivers, truck drivers, taxi drivers, these are semi-skilled individuals that it's not easy for them to find something else. So where I can say on a, on the challenges are in those areas where public policy uh, needs to step up to help with the transition that technology impacts, governments are generally slow and generally reactive and often too late. And so I think the irony is technological advancement is almost always good, but sometimes society just doesn't anticipate pretty straightforward impacts that it can uh, deal with. So I'm very pleased to join you here. I'm looking forward to the dialogue. We have a couple experts on the panel on AI and ChatGPT, which uh, wrote uh, my remarks just now. So <laughs> nice to see you all. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Let's go to and move directly to our first topic. Which sectors, products, and related investments may yield the best results for commerce, humankind, and environment? Jeffrey, I put you on the spot. Uh, could you share some examples where you have seen most clearly how profit and purpose can go well together? Yes, uh, I'll be very brief because I, I just spoke, but I think of some investments uh, that I've even made myself. Um, so one of them, uh, an angel-backed uh, company, it's called Evanes. It um, has created some technology uh, for compostable packaging. So think about straws, plastic straws, that nobody wants plastic straws. So one of the products this company I invested in um, makes compostable straws. So not even recyclable, but compostable straws, so they just disappear into uh, not causing any waste. Uh, also, the same technology around uh, replacing styrofoam trays. So very dramatic, game-changing technology is one of the uh, investments um, that, uh, that we've made. Um, as I said, there's a lot of investment in medical devices. Um, that our angels have made, and all of those are, you could argue, social impact investments, but the reality is no one's going to make those investments unless there's, uh, there's some profit. And so I think those are just two examples. The last one I would say is um, we've invested, I've invested personally in a offshoot of a Turkish company. We're here in, in Turkey. Um, it's a, a company that helps with last mile delivery. So in Turkey, you can think of Gitter. Uh, so this Canadian company is an offshoot, not, not owned by, but is based on the model of Gitter. Um, except in the case of this Canadian company, um, this Canadian company focuses on giving some benefits to the gig workers, the drivers and the pickers who go in, into the store. They've been organized as a co-op. So, uh, you know, lots of criticism about Uber Eats and the Uber delivery. There's lots of fights in different cities uh, between Uber, uh, the way they treat employees, labor relations. So this uh, company uh, has delivery, but it has a program where insurance and some benefits, there's a little contribution on each delivery that the customer makes so that there's insurance and coverage for the drivers, etc. So there you're having a good impact profitable model that thinks about the use of technology and how people can maybe not be left out of the benefits. Uh, and so those are just a few long-winded examples. Thanks a lot. I think uh, it's very nice to hear those examples because it's inspiring. 
there's a lot of solutions out there uh, which can address rather large uh, problems and it's great uh, to hear from that. But you, maybe you would like to add something out of your perspective. In, uh, in my perspective, the technology, if, if the right state of consciousness or the right intention <coughs> plays at the base of that technology, that intention will be expressed by technology and not the other way around. So I believe technology can, and I emphasize can, make a massive difference in the development of humanity. What we are doing is we are using that technology to actually mass customize advice to people, to mass customize the right content at the right time, in the right format for every specific person. And that is wonderful. But the question is always, before you build the technology and before you use it, will it better humanity? I think the why, the, the, the intention. Thank you very much. I will move already to the next topic. I actually have one example I'd like to give on this okay. one, because it's one where we actually made the conscious decision. So with Level X, like our mission is to advance the practice of medicine through video game technology and design. Now there's a few ways you could have done this. You could have said, all right, we're gonna set Level X up as a non-for-profit, and we're gonna raise money and donations to go make games to help educate doctors worldwide. We made the conscious decision to instead do it as a for-profit entity. So we make our games, they're sponsored by Novartis, Amgen, Philips, Medtronic, Baxter, Merck. And as a result of that, we've been able to achieve far greater scale. So we're able to create, through a for-profit model, a virtuous cycle where the more, the better games we make, that the doctors enjoy more, they earn more CME credit, they play more, more doctors play, we make more money, we make more money, we acquire more doctors. And the company has grown and grown and grown to successful exit, generating return for investors, and achieving way more scale. We would have not reached three million people had we tried to create this as a not-for-profit venture. Thank you very much, that was a very nice contribution and also really, uh, reflects a little bit for how we grew Plant Blue, um, so our company. Uh, don't want to go to the next topic and not taking speaking time. <laughs> um, how can we ensure to get funding into innovations that help achieve SDGs? Solutions are out there, but funding comes through too slowly. Ayala, you touched already on that. Would you like to elaborate on that in your experience? I would love to. In the heart uh, failure or cardiac area, this is a very severe disease and it is still unmet need. But uh, very contradictory to that, in the last 10 years, according to bio.org, uh, you can also look at the statistics yourself, the investment in this field is around 3% versus the cancer field. Uh, people or investors flock to the cancer field that they are more motivated because you can take a sample or tumor sampler, match the drug, and you can actually develop your drug according to the uh, unmet need on the cancer field, and the cancer field uh, is very you know, profitable, uh, and insurance companies covering that. But in the cardiac area, it is very difficult, challenging to take a piece from your heart and to try to develop a drug for that. Uh, enabling technology, as I mentioned, uh, our technology has been achieving that already, but still, what is the big problem? The traditional model is you are going to get like 2,500 patients into the clinical trials, which I will say in the recent uh, couple of years ago, Amgen did that, but they uh, couldn't unfortunately make the functional endpoints. That was a uh, very disappointing result, not only for them, but their European partner, Servier, and their other partner, Cardio, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Cytokinetics. And that uh, resulted that uh, investments uh, in the returns were not maybe there. So in uh, the other example, I can say myocardia, they achieved their goal with 250 patient population. I see that as a precision medicine, and that is why we are very much focusing and directing to the precision medicines uh, coming to the society much faster and necessity of funding coming with that. 
So if we can persuade the investors to open their ways to see the cardiac drug development has changed, the technologies is there, they do not need to fund large clinical trials. They can do that similar to the uh, cancer space and precision medicine can be implemented in the cardiac space and it is profitable. Maybe then we can change the dynamic of lack of investments in cardiac and lack of innovation and very slow process in precision medicine development. So that is the part uh, I can uh, emphasize. It will change, uh, but I think the change has to be today and onward. Thanks a lot. Uh, Sheena, on your experience in solar and now working on hydrogen, are we moving quick enough? No, green hydrogen is, is central to energy transition. Uh, I mean, as you well know, the United States, EU, China, Japan, they put some incentives uh, on the road. But if you come to Turkey, for example, there is a, there is a, a strategy, a green hydrogen strategy, which says uh, 2030, only two giga electrolyzer is uh, green hydrogen production capacity. Only two giga. 2035, it says five. If you will ask me, it should be 2030, at least 10. Spain is 70. 2030, Spain says 7 no. Germany is also lagging 15. So it's not, I mean, I would expect more, but and Turkey should have 10, 20, 30, and 20, 35, it should have instead of this 5, 30. Now the minister in the other room was saying there will be money coming from the uh, United States of Emirates for renewable uh, energy investments. Uh, and they made a protocol of 50 billion of which roughly 27 billion will flow to renewable energy. And he was uh, pointing out rightly that if Turkey would, you know, instead of investing such a number of 5 billion over the next 10 years, if we would do it within the next three years, that will reduce our, our dependency from oil and gas. He was saying these two uh, new new sources, uh, I can't judge that, but, but I think this UAE story with 7 billion coming, uh, this is an addition, not any you know, pre-licenses which was already distributed, etc. This is a from state to state program. And I said to him, why not go for green hydrogen and green ammonia and push regional uh, agriculture into value-added agriculture, modern agriculture. Let's see. Now, given the economic backdrop that we have already listened to right, this morning and this afternoon too in Europe and also elsewhere, especially in Europe, uh, where we are exporting a lot of uh, so the, 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 you know, the policy makers should, should, should do a timely rollout to push the green hydrogen uh, you know, investment subsidies, incentives a little bit higher than it is currently. Thank you very much. So now I would like to put Sherry on the, on the spot as an angel investor and also working with governments. Uh, what do you think? Why is funding so slow? Well, thank you, Anna. I, I think it's, it's a mix. Sometimes funding is way too slow, probably more often than not. But sometimes, depending on the uh, industry, it can be very quick. Uh, during the panel earlier, one of the ministers from Turkey mentioned the quick response to the vaccine and how much government funding, private sector coordination to come up with that vaccine that helped us all. Um, so it can be quick. Other examples uh, where there's a lot of government money, is it too fast, is it too slow? 
Uh, we can think about uh, uh, EV vehicles. There's a lot of government funding uh, for EV batteries. It uh, comes uh, originally from the Inflation Reduction Act of the United States, where Congress has put a fortune of taxpayers' money into batteries and plants. Canada has uh, kept up with it in a North American context, is putting hundreds of millions of dollars into battery plants. But the reality is this transition from the internal combustion engine to this desire for electric vehicles, uh, that requires so much production of some critical minerals, a couple of which, in order to get to some of the targets, modest targets for how many electric vehicles there'll be, there has to be a 20-fold increase in the production of certain critical minerals. You've heard of lithium, etc. There's more to it, chromite, etc. That means in the next 25 years, there has to be 20 times the amount of production of some of those minerals that have happened since the beginning of humanity. It is enormous requirement, which is going to be almost impossible to meet. So no matter how fast or how slow uh, how the government money can be, some of these uh, goals are unachievable. What will happen? Technology will come about. Sam will have some colleagues who will invent some kind of technology that reduces the amount of critical minerals that are needed for batteries, and that will solve the problem. Will that come from government spending? Will that come from public-private partnership? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. The last thing I give an example of is where governments have cut off funding. Even the private sector under ESG has cut off funding to oil and gas companies that investing, whether it's a pension fund or individual investors invest, investing in an oil and gas company is verboten. Das ist Deutsch for is not allowed. But that includes, uh, Anna, sometimes there are technologies that our angels have invested in that are technologies to make oil and gas, particularly gas, cleaner or more efficient or to reduce greenhouse gas emissions with the production of um, get, uh, oil and gas. Governments, most, will not fund an oil and gas company to purchase those technologies from technology companies, making it very difficult to facilitate government's own policies. We'll see that come up. The last thing I'll say is at COP28, coming up in Dubai in a few weeks, in a, in a month or two. This is a big issue. If technology companies cannot sell to oil and gas companies because governments and pension funds under ESG say any funding of an oil and gas company, even if it is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or some other technology, this would be a shame. It doesn't matter whether it's fast or slow. Here you have a blanket prohibition that doesn't make any sense. Sorry to go on so long, but uh, on, onward and upward. Thanks a lot. Uh, no, that's really interesting. And um, I would like to add another perspective because uh, out of like an entrepreneur view, um, we also experience that if you have a very disruptive technology, also with a large potential, and you can show the hockey stick and whatsoever, there's still a risk aversion uh, to some projects, especially when you have new technology in new market, um, and uh, you have a technology which is very different to the standard. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to throw that into the pot because I thought it was missing in this discussion round. Uh, I have lots to say to that, so find me if you want to discuss. Um, I would like to move to the next topic. And uh, okay, one minute. Just one, oh, one minute and one word. Uh, so actually, I want to refer to and that was said. And actually, when we look at uh, the work today, we can see that it has a lot really dynamically and the way maybe we didn't forecast. But the thing is, uh, we got to think about that, who is the uh, main actor on the stage right now, who are the main actors and most influential on the stage, like international stage and domestic stage. Like for many centuries, the main actors were the states in the governments. But today I think it has been a great change because the main actors on the stage are international companies having like great budget and great possibilities of investment and financial uh, actual means. So what does it mean? It means that uh, the main finance stream is like through this channel. And we have to say as well another thing, that not every uh, social idea which is good is not a good business idea. So it means that we put very good social ideas which are not good business ideas. 
and like private sector is not going to be uh, interested in those ideas which should not bring a problem. So of course everybody who have been like trying to set up uh, 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 an entity, for example a startup, knows how bumpy is the road to get finance. How many kilometers you get off line, how many people you get out meet, and how many presentations you have to make. And people usually expect you to give them just pretty detailed figures. What's the return on investment within the next five years? How am I supposed to know that? What's going to happen next year? So we've got so many like cases and so many examples in the history that within one day the entire business just went down. Somebody was uh, sending an ice from uh, northern parts of United States to Caribbean countries. And one day somebody was able to provide ice machine and the entire business went down because it didn't make any sense anymore. So the same for example about sulfur which was excavated and one day somebody just uh, provided the possibility of uh, having a sulfur as a side, a side effect of processing an oil and within one day the business went down. So how do we know about that? It's like uh, reading the tea leaves like giving the precise numbers, what's going to happen within five years with our project. It doesn't work like that. Thank you, Darius. I would uh, surprise we got our session a little bit cut. <laughs> so we have very little time left for two very spicy topics. And that is all about risk. So I would like to put them together. So what is the risk of overuse or misuse of technology and unintended consequences. And I would also include in that, to shorten the time a little bit, the potential and risk of AI. So also not only like included in the technology. So it's a huge topic. I would uh, like to ask you that you um, give two short answers. Uh, Mathieu, could you share with us how more technology is not always the answer to elevate our quality of life experience? Yes. Um, I see that all too often we, we build and use technology on the faulty assumption or intention, should we say, that if we have technology, our behavior will change. And I'd like to look at uh, what uh, Anna is uh, working on, but from a preventative perspective. And that is, cardiovascular disease is only one killer today. But standing on a scale, looking at the number, will not make you lose weight to be more healthy. Right? Looking at the result is not going to change your behavior. It never did. Because results are only a consequence of a follow-up of actions, of a behavior. And behavior is only driven by your unconscious belief systems, your programming, and that is driven by your state of consciousness. So, I believe that it's not even a company, or uh, initiatives like social media actually are very well aware of how they are using technology in order to understand our emotional unconscious driving systems to drive us in our behavior to give our data away so they can sell it. Or to companies who do the same thing from that intention, who are driving our behavior into selling their products. So I think that is the biggest risk. I think technology should remain at the development speed as we have today and should even increase as we did. But it's always a question of why are we doing it? What is the intention behind the technology? I think very much. Yeah, I would actually, yeah. I'd like to know what you think about yeah, so that. Yes, I'm going to continue on that one because actually, let's talk about obesity and heart failure, and let's and, and I want to explore the idea. Yeah, we went there. Um, I want to I want to explore the idea of unintended consequences don't actually necessarily need to be bad, and if they are, you can often take them and use them to actually use them to achieve positive outcomes. And let's use the example of obesity. 
So in the United States, the Obama administration spent two to three billion dollars over eight years to try to stem the obesity epidemic in the United States. Finally, during her second term in the White House, Michelle Obama took it up as her personal mission to try to get overweight Americans up off the couch and just go for a walk. All of these meritorious efforts were eclipsed in 48 hours by a single video game that got 40 million Americans up and walking for miles. Now, the purpose of Pokemon Go was not to address the obesity epidemic. They were trying to make money. But in doing so, they were able to achieve an even bigger outcome, right, than what then all of the, you know, all of this government money that was spent to try to achieve the same purpose. Now, also, if you think back, I'll keep on the Pokemon angle, um, there's a reason why those 40 million Americans can name 80 Pokemon characters and can't show you where Turkey is on the map. You're welcome. That's because video games are extremely good at driving learning as an indirect or unintended consequence of play. But you can, as we've seen, if you're smart about it, you can utilize those same neuroscience-based techniques. Expert game designers know how to hit the perfect balance of reward and frustration, challenge and skill to maximize the release of dopamine in the brain at the right frequency to optimize learning. And you can use this to drive positive outcomes with doctors or anywhere else you're trying to change behavior and drive learning outcomes. Thanks a lot. Um, I would like to uh, address Darius because um, with the background on status solution for police and military, does this provide extra sensitivities? Of course, it's, it's, it's uh, a like, big question and a big challenge for uh, control server data and uh, for retain server. Uh, data and as I said before, they can be used in, in the way that is uh, decent one, uh, in the way which is completely indecent. Of course, the artificial intelligence, uh, new digital instruments, uh, they are used. They are used not, not only for uh, good and decent purposes, but they are only they are also used by, for example, criminals. As we have to say that there are no doubts about that. They like very common. Methods of the bad people, let's say, also has uh, have, uh, changed. So actually, that, that's a big problem, uh, and this problem is uh, related to the problem that I mentioned uh, before. Actually, who controls uh, the creation of the new digital instruments and who cares about data? And it also refers to that what I said uh, before: who is able to do that? Because today we use and probably will be using the future. And uh, instruments and technique and models, which are created by the uh, biggest biggest players uh, on the scene, like uh, let's say Amazon, Google, and uh, so on. And actually, it depends on them how we use them and the method uh, that we are going to uh, use. So actually, we get up. We have to, or we want to believe in uh, the good intentions, but also there's a question of that. I control it. It's that's the one of the uh, biggest problems. Of course, we've got like uh, smaller uh, players on this stage, like non governmental organization or like universities and uh, university, uh, universities, uh, university laborator laboratories. But uh, sometimes I'm not sure if they're able to just keep the pace with the uh, biggest players and uh, actually they will not be able to compete uh, in, within this field. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Ayala, I saw you already uh, unmute yourself. So uh, what is about risk uh, unintended consequences in the health sector? And maybe you could also cover um, yeah, uh, what AI means in this sector. Thanks. Yes, I think I would like to mention the AI's good use in the medical sector first. The reason is that in the cardiovascular space, why the investors are shying away to invest is the clinical trials are very expensive and they don't want to invest and lose their money. The, the second reason was the, the FDA needs to approve the drug with successfully on time, not the delayed way, and it's very, very expensive to develop a drug, and especially if the drug is not very efficacious. So the AI is actually very, very helpful to solve these problems in the cardiovascular uh, drug development and cardiovascular care. 
And the third uh, helped the integration. AI also will be useful for integration of the patient bedside records like your uh, medical diagnostics, the, your comorbidities, and whatever your doctor is doing at that moment, your age, your gender, your genetical conditions. They are all your health records is available right now. Your health records can be integrated into your treatment, not only that, into the clinical trials and drug development. It has not been there for cardiovascular and drug development. It will be with AI. Our technology is enabling. And how you use those integration is the stratification of the patient populations. Because cardiac uh, disease is not one disease. It is many, many diseases. And that disease has different genders, woman, man, and different uh, you know, genetical conditions. That is why we need to be able to stratify, and that is possible. What will happen with stratification? Stratification will be also very important for the uh, investors, because now you don't need to bring the entire world to the clinical trials. You have to bring the, the smaller populations, focused populations, and the ones that the, your drug is matching, or you're developing the drug to those populations or subpopulations. That makes more smaller trial, cost effective, and more successful drug uh, availability and approvals. And that is happening in the cancer field, and that is uh, happening in terms of the precision medicine. That is AI's biggest success in the cardiovascular care and that will uh, be very important. The risk is, is if AI is not used this way, and if AI used in a way that drive the cost much further, if AI and data has been utilized in a way that people cannot make good decisions, or many, many decisions that they cannot make any choice, that will be a chaotic uh, way of AI's utilization. But I hope that, and I focus on the others. Yeah, thank you very much. Now I have to become a panelist uh, for one second um, because I'm very passionate about it and I think there is one angle uh, missing. Uh, when we think about risk uh, technology, we have to think that we have it also under control. So I think one of the key things are that also industry takes the ethical standing because with that we can uh, change quite a lot. So um, I'm coming now from the geospatial industry. Imagine no war is being done without this data. Think about you have your mobile phone at all times on you. Everything with is with geospatial data. Every map you use, um, it's so powerful. And also those global companies can make a decision. And also there's a new generation which comes out now from startups. Uh, and SMEs, which bring uh, disruptive technology, but with an ethical behind it. I say that also out of the plain blue perspective, because our data can be highly misused. So we have to make sure that the hardware component uh, is not sold, and that we also have to be very careful and conscious about data sharing. It's all possible, and I think there's also a lot of addition. Of course, governments also have um, their their share and how they can uh, select those companies maybe uh, more with have the sustainable background or have regulation and um, yeah, create market opportunities for those kind of companies. That's another topic. <laughs> I look quickly to the organizer. Um, do we have to punctually end a uh, quarter past or can we maybe also open up the space because we, there's quite a lot of people here who may also would like to raise hands and to the one or the other topic we touch and I see also uh, Jeffrey you also would like to add something and oh, I saw you um, so Jeffrey wants shortly and then I would also like to include the audience uh, very briefly, I'm impressed by the, what you said. This idea of both ethical decisions by investors. Now, there's no monolith. Some investors, some technologists, some people who are inventing things will use it for good, and others will use it for evil. Uh, this happens. Let's take cryptocurrency. Uh, the underlying technology, blockchain, is so important for fintech, 
for medical records, the protection of uh, distributed ledger, all kinds of good uh, utility. But then there's people who will use it for fraud, uh, criminals use it to make payments. Uh, you, you know about them, you know, uh, the, the takeover of people's uh, databases for ransom. So it, it's never going to be so easy. It's not just the dynamic of uh, intended and unintended consequences. There are obvious things that are going to happen uh, that bad people are going to do. Last example, very briefly, that I would give is, you know, this excellent area of using uh, uh, technology for online gaming, in this case, using it for the education of doctors, all kinds of very positive things. It's also used for online gambling, uh, so that you can do roulette and slot machines. I mean, what good does any of that do for society, humanity? But that's the one that makes the most money, I assure you, it's going to yeah. make more money billions than your training of doctors using the, the same technology. At the end of the get day, it's a Hobbesian, or it goes back to Aristotle uh, versus Plato, uh, man and his nature, uh, humanity is either good or evil. So the truth is, they're both, and some people are going to take advantage for technology or invest in technology to do harm and to make a lot of money, and others will do it for good. And you touched on that, the last thing I'll say is the regulation. Just imagine if these cryptocurrencies that we've seen all kinds of people being ripped off in this Rankman Free thing in New York, it's a lack of regulation. Who allowed any investor to invest in a cryptocurrency? It's an investment. The Securities and Exchange Commissions all around the world should have said, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to invest. You're not allowed to hold out some cryptocurrency, just like you couldn't put out a stock or you couldn't put out a bond unless it's regulated. So why were people so asleep at the switch on that aspect, obvious, easy aspect of, of cryptocurrency to actually regulate using existing systems, existing laws, doesn't need anything, but they were behind the eight ball and lots of people lost money and an entire industry has a black mark. So I'll leave it at that, my dear, because I have to catch a flight, but I've been inspired by this conference, by your leadership and the team here, so I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, fascinating discussion. Just to uh, perhaps play devil's advocate, and you talked about regulation, Jeffrey. Um, we entrust our regulation to lawmakers. The same lawmakers, per the IMF, have allowed seven trillion dollars of subsidies to fossil fuels to flow since the last COP before this next COP. Um, a question uh, regarding the use of technology to uh, alter the political paradigm and you talked about manipulation uh, there have been several charges leveled at organizations such as Meta that their technologies have been used to manipulate politics but still we don't seem to be able to change the paradigm where do you think technology can play a part in changing regulation so that we can actually move forward with all these bright ideas and get mass adoption I'd like to take this one um, how much time are we giving <laughs> No, um, I. You, you also want to do words? No, no, no. I just, I, I just want to. If you're not going to do okay. that, the thing, I'll tell you. I can give me two, say two minutes. And I'll yeah. Well. <laughs> um, no, I find it really uh, interesting. Um, I think first um, there has to be an attention for the space. So uh, think about um, uh, tenders, yeah, from uh, from governments. So they have funds for a certain, for instance, for blue carbon projects. And how do you achieve to uh, get these tenders? Um, so you have to partner up with very large global companies which are uh, beforehand are already in exchange uh, to form the tender that it fits to their proposal. So there needs to be an openness for giving market potential uh, to uh, alternative solutions. I think that is very important, and the one goes to the other, and the moment you, you open up the space, I think a lot can be uh, done. So that would be my first answer um, for this. But uh, take it away. Oh, you were, you were good. I, mean, two minutes. I, I, I have an effort on this. <laughs> but uh, I would like to, maybe somebody else wants to say something to that. Please go ahead. Me? Okay, thank you. Yes, no, no, uh, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, I'm grateful for Jeffrey for mentioning regulation about crypto because we are going to open that can of worms tomorrow in this room at 4 p.m. 
when we have the Web3 session. So I'm not going to touch it now. But I wanted to uh, refer to artificial intelligence because I'm working on that. Uh, I am teaching that for many years and so on. And, and you uh, mentioned ChatGPT. Uh, artificial intelligence is much more than ChatGPT. In our models, uh, and we are working on singularity, I'm from singularity land. That is a very small box because you have the inferences and thinking about thinking, and we are going more in the direction of what Matthew was talking. And I just, you know, I have a question for you. I'm very interested in your work, first of all. So my first question was if we can make the AI wake up. But uh, I shifted my question after you continued and explained to us a bit more what you are doing. So can you, uh, or maybe you already have a plan of using artificial intelligence as a, to help us wake up. And we have, a, I just wanted to invite you as well, we have a, a, the BGI, the Beneficial General Intelligence Conference, at the end of February uh, in Panama City, because we want everybody to have access. So uh, it is in a place where uh, it's more open. So just, uh, of course, I hope you will be there to speak as well. But your take on that. Oh, and uh, just one more thing. I'm Mihaela Oliero, so I am uh, president of the Impact Institute for the Digital Economy. What was the question? How, I think the question I understood was how AI can help us to wake up. That's it. Good. Yes, correct. Right. In my opinion, uh, what we're doing at QLX is using the AI as a conversational partner as an assistant to not being uh, busy with uh, putting a lot of data in manually so we're not asking a lot of the person but by asking the right question which are driving immediately towards the basic principles or first principle thinking because the fundamental principles of human development you can if you understand that if you have a million problems actually there are maybe two or three First principles and the base of those million expressions of the same principle. And if you, if your uh, strategy of asking the questions is within that scope, with the right questions, you can deduct an awful lot of information in a few questions. That's what good coaches and therapists are able to do. On top of that, I was talking to the doing visual AI. I think with what is emerging. We could even not only look at the verbal communication, but at the visual, you know, the mimic at what the person is saying with which dinner, uh, you know? um, So I think those things incorporating into uh, the conversation can very fast uh, customize the journey of that person towards a better understanding. We will be working together. We are developing those conversational tools, so we, we all need the advice. Thank you. I would like to give one more time the space to the audience. Yes, please. Would you like to come? Um, maybe send a share. All right. Please. Please. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for the panel. Uh, my name is Kohei. I'm working in the privacy space. Um, due to the, my uh, beliefs, uh, like ethical approaches might be the very important to give a flourishment uh, for the society. In this case, the regulator is discussing the, how we can protect the personal information. But in this case, there is uh, some discussion, such as the we should put the harder approach, which means a uh, very strict regulation. But in a different space, we discuss about the software approach, which is more like um, ex expecting the enterprise or public sectors, they work in a sim uh, spontaneous way to restrict themselves. So my, my question is, uh, which kind of approach is the best for the new technology to create a better society? Uh, we are always like thinking of what kind of direction is the best. So that's, I'm very happy to ask the, some of the speakers who have their own answers to that question. Uh, my, my name is Kohei, I'm working the Privacy by Design Lab. Uh, we are like, working so hard to encourage enterprise and power sectors to protect the privacy laws. That's our mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice question. Would somebody like to jump in? 
research uh, progressive medicine is associated to uh, GDPR mainly. That's like the main concept of GDPR. <coughs> so actually, it's, 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 a very, it's a very interesting, attention grabbing, and uh, as well, difficult question because we've got like a few options regulation by uh, the state, by the regular legislator, self regulation, or just uh, backing, up, backing on the uh, ethical regulations or ethical. I know regulations of conduct and so on. So it's like very difficult. So the first question we have to answer and diagnose the issue whether that it's possible to provide and to draw up regulations which will be uh, very precise and which will be applied to all the situation that we may uh, face just using artificial intelligence or, or digital instruments. So actually, it's a very difficult question, and I think the answer is negative. So we cannot do that. We cannot just uh, let the legislature is not able using just words to regulate every aspect of uh, our activity uh, concerning artificial intelligence and digi digital work. So self-regulation sounds good, but it's completely ineffective from the legal point of view. There is no like execution instruments, ethics. So we have to answer this question: whether the ethics can be the main regulation instrument. Uh, by our sons. Of course, my answer is no, because as we said, it's like uh, all those instruments are used as well for that very bad purpose. Yeah, if I may just jump in here, because technology itself can help. And so we are developing, and that is now the good side of crypto. Yeah, so we are developing cryptographic uh, uh, methods, maybe also. Uh, we are calling it that generically the internet of knowledge. So the idea is that your private data stays private because it's encrypted and but then it can be combined with other private data into the whole pool and process is equally uh, eff effective as now it is processed with the centralized databases and that is solving the pro uh, privacy problem so if you uh, want to see how it's hypercycle.ai but yeah i will be speaking more about this tomorrow uh, at 4 30 in the web 3 session so i think uh, Thought the technology is really a good, uh, good uh, solution for this. Otherwise, I agree but, with you. But there is very hard. Make the regulation issue obsolete. That is my point. Good. So I think the question uh, to, to regulate or not regulate doesn't concern only the privacy. It's like has got that much more spec much uh, wide spectrum of all elements and aspects. And uh, actually, somebody like to uh, try to answer this question, that would, that would be great. But the question was about privacy, that was my understanding, that's why I <laughs> referred to that. So thank you very much. I mean, it's a very difficult question, and I think we need to come also to the closing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we get the watch time. Um, I think what would be my key takeaway is that technology can be used for good, can be used for bad, for sure change how the world works, and that we should be conscious we can use this AI, which we also use in our company, for good, for doing stuff, automated things, which were not possible before, scale things, optimize things, um, which enables also a lot of very good things. But I think what came really out in the discussion is that we need to stay conscious and make decisions. Do impact investment. See what, or what on the government uh, uh, level we can do for regulation, uh, regulation and also uh, see what is out there else. And also the industry, uh, I think it's far too less discussed um, to, yeah, to go a sustainable way, to go an ethical way. And I think there's a lot of potential um, to change things and to use uh, technology for, for the good. So with these words and uh, optimism, I would like to close uh, the session. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. I thank a lot the panelists and also the great discussion we had here in the room. Thank you so much and enjoy.
and yeah. upstairs. Tell them there's a prize after this. I said, no. yeah. Nations Secretary General, 
Um, and it is an indicator, I wouldn't say a leading indicator, I would say it is a trailing indicator of the importance of technology to societal, um, to societal function and governance and, and rights. Um, and to talk about uh, the roadmap, and I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the essential pieces of the roadmap are the following. So the purpose, the main theme of the roadmap is to, is to connect, respect, and protect humanity. Right? Once again, it's, it's around being connected, being respected, and being protected. And even when you just hear those, those, those terms, and having been entrenched with the internet, all of us, and social networks for the last, um, let's say for the last most part of 25 years, I think we very well know some of the challenges and why some of these phrases and themes have come up in the United Nations Digital Cooperation uh, Plan. So that's one piece. The other state setting I want to do before I move into the introductions are the essential pieces of the roadmap. There were four or five pieces, pieces I might not have justice to capture. Might not have done justice to capture all of them, but uh, here are the key pieces of the digital cooperation roadmap. One is universal connectivity, and I will invite elaboration around this from our esteemed panelists in just a few moments. The second is digital inclusion. The third is protecting human rights online. And the fourth is strengthening digital capacity building. Right? Once again, that's universal connectivity, digital inclusion, protecting human rights online, and strengthening the strengthening digital capacity building. Right? If there were a white a whiteboard over here, I would have jotted them down, but just try to keep a mental note or something on a notepad because we will keep coming back to that. Let me now turn our attention to a little bit of introduction. And I want to start with Sanjay Dupudu who I just found out lives in the same city that I do, except that we had to come all the way over here to meet each other. Uh, I'll come to my introduction in just a moment, but let me turn it over to Sanjay to introduce uh, uh, your backup, please. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks for giving us this opportunity to speak about this, uh, this topic. My name is uh, Sanjay Japudi. I'm originally from India. I moved to the US 15 years back. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. I started uh, Quintilia Technology Services Company eight years ago, and we serve customers across the U.S. and we have offices across the world. Uh, and and like, like I said, happy to be here and uh, be part of this panel. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, and let's turn it over to um, to Emin from Azerbaijan. Uh, Emin, a few words of your background. Thank you, Kuvinder. Uh, my name is Emin. I'm from <coughs> Azerbaijan. I live in Turkey last three years. And I represent an uh, inclusive marketing platform, Kickface. Uh, it's an online marketplace connecting brands with social media influencers. Uh, it's a Dubai based company. Uh, last seven years, we are growing it uh, to 42 countries. We have more than uh, 550,000 social media influencers in our network. Uh, last two years, we uh, created a Web3 based metaverse, <coughs> social metaverse platform where influencers can have their private spaces and uh, make you know, private events and engage with their fans uh, on a, in an immersive environment. And uh, that was also called uh, good attention by the VCs and the, and the partners. Yeah, currently we are more focused on the Metafluence, a uh, social metaverse project for influencers. Thank you, Evan. And I might pick up on some of those, uh, some words of the introduction, particularly around privacy, um, and uh, have some provocation around that just a few minutes later. Uh, Mikhail? Uh, Thank you for joining. And a few words of your introduction, please. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mikhail Chavish. I started my professional career as school teacher, teacher of math. After that, I spent more than 20 years in international um, uh, 
manufacturing industry, municipal finance industry. I was involved in different manufacturing projects in Russia, India, Vietnam, Kazakhstan, uh, Indonesia, and some other countries. And uh, for the last uh, four years, uh, I'm founder and CEO of Crowdsourcing Agency. We specialize in crowd intelligence. It means that we create communities of uh, volunteer experts and supporters around different promising uh, companies, organizations, and projects. And the members of this community, the members of the crowd, uh, will, will help uh, these companies or these organizations with their intelligence, their imagination, their creativity to find some uh, creative uh, solutions uh, to the most complicated and unusual uh, business issues and problems and challenges. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, it's very exciting for me uh, to get the latest update from you as we go through the discussion on you know, the phenomenon of crowdsourcing uh, and hand in hand with that uh, you know, some of the work that even I have been more open source sort of side of thing really involves the discussion around uh, more openness and more more um, uh, more inclusive in terms of inviting not just access but inviting participation. Uh, great. So we have uh, uh, what I would say a fairly full panel as far as brain power is concerned. Um, I think a couple of our panelists didn't uh, had some last minute uh, uh, challenges in logistics. Um, so. My name is uh, Garvinder Alwalia. Uh, I am the founder and uh, CEO of Digital Twin Labs based in Dallas. I've been in the technology industry for um, over 25 years uh, in an independent uh, entrepreneurial role at Digital Twin Labs uh, for about five, six years, where we deploy strategic implementation, strategic platforms, most of those platforms that we create strategy, create architecture, and deploy are based on frontier technologies, uh, specifically AI, blockchain, digital assets, and uh, IoT and cloud. Cloud is pretty much a common in anything and everything. Uh, I will function uh, partly as a panelist, but also the moderator, as you can tell. Um, let me. Uh, let me, let me invoke the discussion by citing to you some data that I researched into you, in, uh, that I researched into about, about three weeks ago. Uh, I was, uh, I spoke at uh, the panel, uh, one of the panels or two of the panels at the United Nations Science Summit in New York City while the UN uh, GA was, was going on. And it was really inspiring uh, on one of the, inspiring as well as scary, I might say, one of the, one of the quantified facts, right? So we talk about inclusivity, we talk about digital democracy, we talk about freedom, digital rights, and access. And there is not a whole lot of data that I've run into which is quantifying the impact, positive or negative, for those missions. And this interesting data that I ran into basically says that if a country cuts off its internet, if a country cuts off its internet, it loses $25 million of GDP per 10 million users, per 10 million of its citizens per day. So the impact of removing internet access is not just one of freedom and social uh, impact, it is actual economic impact that has been quantified. And once again, that impact is losing 25 million per 10 million of citizens per day. And I think we either might be from countries where that has happened, or we know sufficiently about those countries where that has happened, or we have friends and relatives in countries where that has happened. That on the one side, on the other hand, the United Nations has come up with the digital cooperation movement. And I will add, before I give it to the panelists with a question, I will add that sometimes we are dismissive of these frameworks that come from large institutions. 
I personally, in my area and practice of work and implementation, have used uh, not just as ideas and for reference, but for actual implementation of platforms, have used United Nations created specifications. Regulatory, like the United Nations Kimberley process, which is a set of regulatory requirements, wouldn't call it regulatory guidelines because nothing from the UN is regulation. UN is not a, 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 an enforcement agency. Guidelines, and that is to eliminate or to mitigate uh, blood diamonds, uh, money laundering because of diamonds, terrorist activity because of diamonds. And I speak to that very passionately because there are two um, platforms for trade of diamonds that I have been instrumental in implementing one during my tenure at IBM, where I was the CTO for IBM North America and co-founder of the blockchain business uh, for a diamond startup, and the other as Digital Twin Labs, we implemented the platform for global trading of diamonds for the beers. The second thing from the United Nations, I want to give, I want to give fair credibility um, to the products that have, to the work products that have come out from the United Nations. The second thing is for smart containers. For any of you that are in global logistics, global trade. There is actually a specification from one of the arms of the United Nations, technical specifications around smart containers, global shipping containers. So I went on a little bit side tangent, but only to give you specific data. And by the way, the second example I gave you is also what I have used in implementation. Again, two, two examples, one while at IBM for implementing the Trade Lens platform, which is a blockchain based platform for global tracking of uh, containers in partnership with MERS, which I might confess as an update, uh, collapsed uh, about three, four months ago. And the confession uh, I make is because my early fingerprints were on that program. So there are hard learning lessons and bruises on my back as well. Uh, I might sound very polished, but uh, these are learning lessons. I have bloody, I have a bloody nose too. Uh, and the other one, as this one that is for, I'm sorry, that should not happen. Uh, that was my morning to 5.55 alarm. <laughs> uh, the other one is for a global logistics company also, uh, similarly. Um, so I wanted to take a moment to ground the credibility of the work that has been created by the United Nations, because traditionally, and, and me too, me and Kulpa, right, have been dismissive about what has, what has come out from many of these institutions. So the question that I would now turn to elaborate uh, on the main topic of digital cooperation, um, I will turn it over to Sanjay. Sanjay, is digital right a human right? Uh, thanks to Rudra for the great setup of the, of the panel. Um, I definitely think digital right is a human right. And I, you know, from the research I have done with uh, United Nations and UNICEF in, in particular, uh, some numbers, if you hear these, you'll, you'll understand how important uh, digital rights are. So, according to UNICEF, two-thirds of the world's school-age children don't have internet connection in their home. Uh, close to 63% of 15 to 24-year-olds 24 don't have an uh, internet connection at home. Uh, close to a quarter billion of students are still affected by COVID closures. We all forgot COVID and, and Still, there's 250 million people that still have, uh, in, they still cannot attend school during, 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 because of COVID closures. Right? My daughter, who, who lives in Dallas, she's, whenever there's a closure, for whatever reason, this, you know, in Dallas, if you, are, if you have half inch of snow, everything pauses like good with the nose, right? And they conveniently get on, a, on their high speed internet and get on to the school. And school is normal, except they don't have a physical activity. School is normal for, for kids in, in, in the US who have access to internet, right? So keeping all of this in mind, I think uh, uh, it, it, it has to be a human right, just like you know, water um, and, and security and housing. Uh, digital should become a human, a human right. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. And you know, we'll continue down the path of um, the, the flow that I described earlier. One is we got the definitional thing on what the digital cooperation is about. Now we are in the section, the second section of the flow, which is like, get, let's get an interpretation from the, uh, from the, from the experts here uh, on their thoughts. And the third section will be about, about apply and action, right? Uh, particularly from the work that they are doing. So 
Uh, I'm going to modify that question a little bit, Emmett, for you, because now you know the answer. I don't, I don't want you to just agree with that. Uh, I promised the audience over here a provocative uh, discussion. Um, so I'm going to modify the question, right? So it is still the question, is digital rights a, a human right? And, and you know, why or why not? Uh, are there any nuances in recognizing digital right as a human right? Especially in the underserved areas, um, the people's access to internet uh, doesn't only give um, the right to socialize, to get information, but in the three, become the part of the economy, global economy, and become the part of the community-driven networks. Those are having access to uh, education, having access to finance, and uh, that's uh, and that's one of the I think important aspects uh, of the making internet accessible, uh, especially from the web three point of view. So uh, it's, a, it's a right, uh, and uh, it's a right not only to take information and learn, uh, but also uh, become the stakeholder of the global economy, especially in the countries where. Uh, we don't have a chance uh, to get to the, you know, some communities, to get some, uh, some education, but in Web3, uh, I believe these uh, problems are being solved because of the fundamentals of Web3, because of the centralized culture uh, and oh, centralized culture and uh, community-driven networks and digital ownerships. Thank you. Thank you, Amin. Um, should I just leave the question the way it is, or you want me to throw some different color on it? Ah, well, you can modify uh, if you want. So. All right. Um, <laughs> I'll, uh, thank you. I, I, I love the boldness. So, uh, so uh, I'll modify it. So, in most countries, uh, even in democracies, privacy is not a constitutional right. I'll speak from the United States, and privacy is not a constitutional right in the United States. And the reason I said democracy is because that's a little bit higher litmus test. If you talk about non-democracies, you know, by definition, privacy is not a right in those places. So the question I modify and, and submit to you is, is if privacy is not a constitutional, let's just say, human right, why are we making the argument that privacy and digital rights should be should be an important com component? Um, ah, well, uh, maybe it was my fault that I asked you to modify the question because uh, now it become much more difficult. Um, uh, well, first of all, I'd like uh, to point out that, in my opinion, privacy should be one of the basic human rights, not uh, only in digital area, but everywhere. So it's one of the fundamental uh, rights, uh, even if it is not mentioned in some constitutions. You know, there are some countries, some democratic countries, that don't have constitutions at all. The UK, for instance. Uh, it's um, one of the important uh, fundamental rights in any uh, developed uh, society. Um, uh, but um, uh, m maybe I will try to answer this question uh, from um, the perspective of my uh, latest uh, project in crowd intelligence. So it is uh, when you create the community of people which uh, are able to um, uh, make some input and help to develop different companies or different projects. 
The most important question is if you want to select some sub-community within the big community or not. So for instance, you can invite only people with university degree, or you want to invite only people with some professional skills in some certain areas, or you want to invite everybody. So if you select people, you decrease the opportunity of crowdsourcing. Because crowdsourcing works in particularly in the situation when you don't know how to solve the problem. When you have standardized problem, you are able to solve it with standardized approach. So in this case, you, you know that you need, for instance, people who have professional skills in, I don't know, biology, in chemistry, in marketing, in uh, whatever, uh, in, uh, in IT, uh, but if you, don't, uh, if you don't have standardized algorithm how to solve the problem, you, won't, you need to invite different people. And you don't know what professional skills, what uh, professional or life experience will be important for the solution of the problem. So that's why if you select people for crowdsourcing projects, you, you, you can lose, you can decrease the potential of the project. So why privacy is important? Because if you have privacy participants, you have no opportunity for selection because you don't have information about them. So to keep the privacy very important uh, for efficiency of such projects. And once again, I will come to the beginning of my uh, brief speech. Uh, in any case, I believe that even before uh, the digital era, privacy was one of the fundamental rights <coughs> of any human being. And uh, the beginning and the continuation of the digital era uh, uh, didn't uh, change anything in uh, the situation of human rights. It was the same as it was uh, uh, two centuries ago, three centuries ago, at the time of French Revolution, at the time of the War of Independence uh, in the US, in the time of uh, uh, first and Second World War in New York. So it, it was one of the fundamental human rights uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Your microphone. Was oh. Right. Um, thank, you. thank you. I think I need to what Mikhail said. Uh, okay, there's you. more data about us. Uh, just oh, no, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, you got to yeah. press the upper edge of the button and figure that thing out. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll yeah. try to, to check uh, it. Sanjay, why don't we uh, just take, adding, take your uh, comments and then we'll go to the audience. Yeah. I'm just adding to one point what, what, what Michael said. Uh, digital privacy is far more important than, than and both privacies are important. They should be, uh, there should be you know, changes in the laws to, to make them right. Uh, but digital privacy is far more important because there's so much data about a person in the digital world than in the real world. Uh, so it becomes even more important uh, to have that as a, as a system. Perfect. Uh, let me. Thank you. Uh, let me. I, I, I didn't mean to hasten it, but I, I, I want to get the audience's uh, input for questions. Uh, well, either questions or any other remarks. Uh, before I, before I come with my role as a panelist and ground, you know, a little bit more thinking on this, and then we move on to the next question. So, questions from the audience, please. Well, yeah, you got a question, I could tell. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a question, I do I have many comments, yeah, but uh, sure. uh, thank you. I'm Mihaila Uliero, President of the Impact Institute for the Digital Economy. I'm very interested in, in your work on crowdsourcing uh, collective intelligence, I would call mm -hmm. it, yes? And yeah. this is a very big thing and very important for the future of humanity in general. And I think that's, at least when the internet started, this was the purpose, right? And what it turned into is something else. So, um, yeah, so I have a few comments on the privacy, uh, I mean, maybe one comment, yes. It is not a constitutional right. And I would like maybe someone on the panel can address the privacy versus transparency, because obviously, yes, there are, if it's all privacy and no transparency, uh, then Transparency International <laughs> will have a very hard job, for example. So I think that is, maybe that's why it's not there. I do not know. I would like to know if, if there is any connection there. And um, I would also like to, to uh, know your opinion about... So let's, uh, uh, let's just finish let's that start. comment okay. and then uh, <laughs> yes. give them a chance to respond and then see if there's a turn for others yeah. and then if there isn't, we'll come back. 
Yeah, I'd like to make a very small remark about uh, privacy versus transparency. I think that if we speak about human rights, we need uh, to make privacy as a top priority. But if we speak about corporates, if we speak about companies and organizations, I think that we should forget about privacy as priority and to prioritize transparency. Because if, it, if you uh, represent uh, uh, corporate uh, entity, uh, you don't, uh, you can't use the same uh, rights as a human being. It's a big difference. So I am in favor of uh, transparency in case of legal entities. But uh, in case of human beings, I am in favor of privacy. I disagree. Uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, let me, let me um, get a little bit more diversity on the response. Uh, Sanjay Evan, if any of you want to Add to that. Any other questions? Uh, Lillian, right? No, Denise. Oh, sorry. Denise, yeah. Um, how do I open You got it on? There you okay. go. I think the trick on the button is you got to push it at the top edge of it. Sure. Um, <laughs> as a private lawyer in Turkey, uh, I would like to add some uh, of my thoughts uh, about discussion. Um, in Turkey, uh, we had uh, our constitution has the privacy rule. Uh, 20 Article 20 talks about privacy, uh, especially. And then, uh, 2016, we had a specific data privacy law regulation uh, enacted. Uh, um, but it, we needed to wait uh, for a while. Uh, but finally, we have um, an authority who is um, regulating um, privacy in different sectors, including technology. And I'm sure um, Europe is the leading um, regulatory body, uh, like every other uh, regulational concept. Uh, and it is uh, on this privacy subject. Europe is uh, leading the world uh, regulation. GDPR is uh, one of the most important uh, regulation on that. And US is uh, coming, uh, I think, in different states, New York, Colorado, California. California was the first to uh, enable the, uh, uh, the Privacy Act. Even maybe not in the US Constitution, uh, there, the First Amendment uh, might be considered as uh, uh, a privacy protection for, for people. So uh, we are kind of in need of balance, right? If we, if we, even though we don't have maybe specific regulations already in some part of the world, uh, we, in order to balance the human rights, we need to kind of find a way whatever we have already in the regulation, to ban it as if we can protect the human rights, uh, which is the basic uh, rights, privacy, I believe is uh, one of them. Thank you. Can you introduce your name? For um, my name is Denise, uh, Denise Günger. I'm the uh, owner of Günger Law Firm. Um, and one of our uh, specialties, data protection. So that's why I wanted to share my opinion about that. Uh, we are following the world regulation already. Yes. That's why I wanted to give some comparison between the uh, lines. Thank, thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry about some names mixed up, but we had a um, good discussion over dinner yesterday, and uh, not only the introduction that she gave about the current work, but she's also been a general counsel in large corporations in Turkey. So. Uh, thank you for keeping us honest and thank you for educating me about uh, the privacy elements in the Constitution over here in Turkey. Um, uh, let, me, uh, let me just ground a few thoughts from my end uh, because then I want to move on to other topics. Privacy is not the only game in town. <laughs> All right, so a um, few thoughts. One is <clears throat> um, I, I think that we we, when we try to mirror social, human, analog behavior into digital, we think it's just a direct translation. And it might be, but I might argue, coming from a computer science background, 
that we need the help of the sociologists, we need the help of the economists, we need the help of the lawyers, we need the help of really social sciences and our computer scientists, social scientists, to help us out in this, which is one of the great magics of you know what, what for us is brings together. And so there's a dual challenge with it, right? There's a dilemma. One is there's an expectation we can bring everything that is done in a in an analog human society and make that in digital, right? And I think the dilemma is twofold. Number one, when we do that, we also bring the aberrations of human society into the aberrations of technology. Technology at the end of the day is just technology, it's inanimate. But when we mobilize it and activate it with logic and behavior and interaction, it also begins to reflect the badness and the darkness of human society. That's one dilemma. The other dilemma is very interesting. The other dilemma is that we expect more from our machines. We expect more from our machines. So digital platforms are machines and we expect them to behave better than us. Now, in, in, in the case of digital platforms, so, okay, that might be right. Uh, and that, incidentally, the most accentuated uh, demonstration of that observation is in autonomous driving. If you, if you heard of something called the model machine, you might not have heard of it that way, but you might have, I'm sure, heard of the concepts that if an autonomous vehicle is driving, and I, as an autonomous vehicle, have a choice of hitting a motorcyclist with a helmet, or a mother pushing a stroller. What is the choice of, what is the ethical, right? it's not just privacy, it's not the only, what is the ethical choice that machine should make? Right? So that's the reason it's called a moral machine and a moral dilemma. Uh, at the end of the day, there is a finiteness of machines. And just like to her is human, to engineer is also uh, human. Um, so there is a finiteness and we expect these machines to be better. But these machines will not be better just overnight or in a matter of you know six months or you know five POCs or two, three, five years or VCs putting more money. It is a maturity process of technology innovation that has to happen. So I'll just close um, uh, you know, with, 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 that, with that part as far as uh, the privacy topic is concerned. Uh, I want to go into a few other topics, right? So why, why is the aspects of digital cooperation an element of cooperation on the one hand, right? So from the United Nations. Now, of course, looking at the duties of the United Nations, talk about cooperation, but at the same time, we don't even have to discuss like Web3 latest cutting edge frontier technologies. You look at cloud technologies, and when I was running the cloud business at IBM, we had jurisdictional uh, uh, we had jurisdictional barriers around countries not wanting their data to go out, and this is not just PII personal personally identifiable. Uh, Amandi, tell me out. PII personally identifiable information PII data. It's not just PII data. Some countries, thank you. Uh, there's a lot of brain brain power in this room. I I, I know so many people here, uh, much smarter than me. So there's not just um, PII kind of information that can't be sent out of the country. Some countries will not allow their seismic data to go out of the borders. And I know that from covering the, the oil and gas corridor in the great state of Texas and clients like, uh, you know, uh, ExxonMobil, uh, Schlumberg, uh, Halliburton, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so, how do we how do we tussle? Uh, I'll, I'll start the question with with Mikhail. How do we tussle with 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 UN guidance on the one hand emphasizing cooperation, and the other on the other hand we are presented with jurisdictional sovereignty and and, and barriers. Well, another difficult and uh, this a bit provocative question. Um, <laughs> but I, I will tell you this, even though you keep saying it's provocative and it looks like to everybody that I'm putting you on the spot, but I'm really not. Your answer last time was a brilliant answer. Uh, uh, 
Uh, you know what what what, uh, what, what is the difference uh, in um, between uh, this panel session and, for instance, our crowdsourcing projects? In our crowdsourcing projects, we give people enough time to think, and in uh, this panel session, I have only uh, a few seconds. Well, uh, uh, I would say I think that uh, today we have. Uh, a lot of limitation from concrete countries and concrete governments. And I think that in general it's not good. Unfortunately, we are not able uh, to um, uh, cancel this uh, limitation. Uh, and also after the pandemic, I think that it is the um, uh, temporary trend for more isolation and less globalization. Uh, but in I hope that in the future, and maybe in the near future, it will be less limitations. Because, of course, these limitations are, uh, are the serious barrier for, for the development of uh, new technologies and uh, uh, developing better society in different countries. Thank you, Michael. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you so much for taking it on the spot. Evan, you're ready to go. I, I would briefly add that actually uh, this is not the problem uh, for the small countries but the big big countries uh, because big countries small countries uh, in opposite want to be part of developing world and want to integrate uh, to the global economy but rather than protecting their their uh, information and data uh, but big countries especially some close countries you know, they are very uh, cautious on this topic, and uh, we are facing such, um, we are not facing, but we are planning, we, are, we think that we will face such difficulties as a metaverse platform when we grow uh, to different countries, and we see uh, some um, interest, for example, from Iran, from uh, some close countries, that people want to be part of our platform, and of course they will share some data. We are, like from the legal point of view, we are thinking that should we put some barriers or should be like someone will ask from us something in the future and so. But um, in the metaverse and web three, in the web three era, uh, the borderless uh, internet, the borderless communication, uh, the, I think this is the future. And uh, in the, at the end of the day, that direction will be. Thank you, man. Sanjay. Yeah. So what you know, UN suggested is uh, we have to identify ways to ma maximize the benefits of digital for everyone, right? Uh, it's so e I mean, it's not easy. It's a big task uh, in itself. And since uh, you know we, we're going into the digital world, uh, UN also said that address the risks and challenges associated with with making the world digital, which is of privacy, cybersecurity, and you know things like that, right? So what you want this is literally to go make sure when you are making the world digital, ensure this privacy and, and security for, for people who are getting onto the digital platform because many of them will be getting onto this platform for the first time ever, right? And they're not protected by, by their companies or not part of the organization, right? So, and, and I think they, they both, you cannot do one and forget the other is what I feel. Uh, both of them have to go in battle. All right. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. I, uh, in sort of a switch the order, but I'm going to open it up as I've been making previous previously. Um, if anybody wants to ask a question in general or otherwise specifically comment on um, on the topic we are on, which is around kind of global, you know, jurisdiction standards, barriers, those kind of things. Yeah. Uh, let me take this and then I'll come to you. Uh, somebody, please give the mic microphone. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for the panel session. The, my name is Kohei. I'm working on the privacy by designer. So the, my previous topics, the privacy is also my concerns. Uh, in, in terms of the design of topics, uh, I'm also the very curious about the standardization. Just like the, there is a, some of the like uh, international associations such as the ISO that's kind of the standards are making, which is uh, helping the like. Uh, enterprise or public sectors to follow uh, this kind of new movements. So uh, I, my, my question is uh, how we can use this kind of 
uh, international bodies to apply uh, the basic uh, fundamental rights into designing of the processes of the solutions. So, you have any questions about this? It's very Great. happy to listen. Great. So, uh, how do we apply uh, any standards body and work that has been done um, to solve this kind of problem? Um, who wants to take that on? Otherwise, I will. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't mean to preempt you. I'm going to say something. So please sit in your company before you go. I cannot answer this question. Okay. Sanjay, any comments? Um, I did cite the United Nations Community Process. So it, it, it also is, you know, depends on specific domain. which is a um, compliance framework um, with 80 country signatories to it uh, that uh, that have to comply with it. Uh, actually, I think it is a compliance requirement. Only thing is, the US has these compliance requirements, but they are not an enforcing institution. Um, that is widely used. I'm not saying that it has removed any money laundering you know, or money laundering blood damage from the of diamonds, but it's about mitigation. So um, the GDPR actually, uh, and that was mentioned by you, the way I describe it many times even in the US is the best thing that happened as far as privacy is concerned in the United, in, in, in the United States is GDPR in Europe. <laughs> so the US benefited greatly from the privacy and other aspects that GDPR provided. So there are a lot of examples. If I go back to my career when I was younger, uh, that's how the uh, IETF, um, uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force, that is how the World Wide Web, World Wide World Web, World wow. Wide Web. Thank you, thank you. Time to start after lunch. Um, <laughs> put in standards for that. Um, that's how ISO for that ITU. There are a lot of precedents from legacy technologies. I'm going back to wired telephony and then with cellular telephony. The other great thing that happened in getting the industry to interoperate in the US, US as you know is very, very competitive um, and couldn't get itself to align on cellular standards. It used to cost me 10 cents per text message to send from an AT&T to a Verizon operator, those kind of things. Anyway, those of you from US would know that. <laughs> and because everybody had their own patchwork of cellular islands until 3GPP came on. And 3GPP or 3G uh, partnership program is the standard body uh, inspired from Europe, which put together what we all benefit from today. And that is 3G cellular, 4G cellular, and now on to 5G cellular. Right? And then after a few years, everybody in the US lined up to the 3GPP programs. So there are lots of examples. I can give you, I can give you another half a dozen outside the room later. Uh, yes, I promised you. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I have a few. Uh, actually, I will be very brief now. But I, I see a parallel between the previous uh, question and this one, obviously. So now it's uh, uh, openness versus, uh, if let's say, uh, close, uh, yes, uh, policy for the internet. And Vinsurf, which you mentioned, the World Wide Web, uh, he actually had, a, with the Internet Governance Forum, so he had the people-centered internet, which means the open internet, yes, he was fighting for that kind of internet from the beginning, actually. And uh, we were talking here about the decentralized culture as well. So I think um, the issue is, not resolved. <laughs> it's been a fight all together, but it's a very similar issue with the privacy versus transparency here. So do we want to cooperate and live in an open world? But in that world, we will have to be ethical ourselves. And I, I do not see we will solve it until our own degree of humanity is not going to be solved. This is uh, what I wanted to underline. And UN emphasizing cooperation versus jurisdictional sovereignty they can probably uh, do something in that regard and sponsor education or other means uh, for people to 
tackling that ethical, you will call it into a moral dilemma, but uh, this is not that easy to solve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. If, if, um, I, can add, if I can just add to that. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. You know, I'm, I'm going to start inviting questions and inputs from this side of the room, otherwise I'm going to ask some of you to move here, so we're <laughs> going to get a balance of discussion in the room. So. Yeah, please. Uh, there's a whole concept called uh, informed consent. Like, this is my data, and this is the specific purpose to be used for. And as a company, if you're using that data for something else, you have to take an explicit consent from users again. But somehow, it does not apply in case of governments. And that's another issue that we need to deal with. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, no why, why don't you go ahead uh, and then we'll finish yeah. up with Sorry. Thank you. Thank you too. Yeah, um, I think moving from um, basic human rights as a privacy concept, as a basic human rights, uh, it is important uh, that it is a national security uh, and uh, look at that way. Uh, and, um, and I can understand uh, it is uh, it is a weapon uh, of uh, new age, uh, the protecting um, nations' uh, information. To put it that way uh, is 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 very important. Health care uh, information, especially um, special data, uh, including in that biometrics. Um, all these information, we need to know what's going to happen. And the nations should know what's going to happen if that data is out of somewhere uh, with some people with bad interests. And we know that the, the countries are using <coughs> the uh, data war uh, to uh, put the other down. So it is um, it is great um, your comment or question uh, how we can find a solution about uh, harmonizing uh, to find harmonized uh, regulation. But when it comes to divided world, who are using data to against each other? how we can come up with a regulation or a solution to find uh, a common uh, cause or common uh, benefit for countries as well as people per se. What I see uh, in future, we will face uh, another uh, case uh, which we have seen already two parts of it, shrimps. Uh, Schrems, Maximilian Schrems is, is a, a European Union uh, citizen who were fighting uh, against Facebook uh, transferring the European citizens data from Europe to US and why he was fighting for that uh, was he was against uh, that a European citizens information uh, was accessible uh, from the government because of the National Security Act. So he fought for that. Uh, the, the first case he won, uh, it was back in 2020. Um, and at the end of that uh, decision, there was safe harbor between Europe and the US that was cancelled. And uh, a new regulation came after that and uh, a new regulation increased the uh, standards transferring data from Europe to US but uh, you know your regulation is something but putting regulation in use is something else and you mentioned about having an explicit consent that is a ridiculous thing when transferring data uh, to uh, out of uh, from one place to another. Sometimes many people doesn't know why, what they are agreeing or why. 
and sometimes they are giving the explicit consent for transferring data to another country because they are obliged to have that service from that service provider. So there are lots of things to consider when transferring data from one place to another. Okay. Yeah. Enough. So, and there is another case, Shrams 2, that cancelled. Uh, I actually, I might want to pause you over there yeah. before you move to the next case. Sure. Because those are really, uh, and by the way, coming from an international lawyer, I think those are really new nuances, those are really great nuances. I just want to give Edith a, a, a few cycles sure. to, to finish her point and then sure. we can come back uh, if we have time. Just to do a time check while we're at it, we'll probably go, um, Bushak, we'll probably go for another about, I think we started around 45, 50. We go for an hour, so that leaves us about 15, 15 minutes. There is a six o'clock session, and everybody needs a break before you go to that. So, uh, so if you go to your question, then we will uh, finish the third section, uh, which is application and actions, okay? And then we might have some grounding kind of thoughts from, from a few of us. Edith, please. Thank you very much. My name is Edith Norman. I'm the chairman of the Netherlands India Chamber of Commerce and Trade, and I'm a lawyer in the managing part of the firm in Amsterdam. So um, I wanted to point out something that we haven't uh, talked about. We all know that data, as you said, consent is, yeah, it is really just for the show because um, you cannot use any applications without um, switching on to the consent. I mean, talking about data, we all have this device and using it gives so many people the right to follow you your phone will tell you in the morning where you're going because they are following you and they will say it will take you 25 minutes to your work and it's not because you ask because it's following you you have given consent regularly because otherwise your phone is not going to work and if the general terms and conditions are changing the phone is asking you please consent to our new general terms and conditions and the only way not to do that is not to have a phone. <laughs> so, um, I think one aspect that we have to And by the way, I will come back to that point. Okay. One aspect that we have to look into is education. I'm not talking about children and school, which is one part of it, but educate people about what it means. Because most people would say, oh, whatever, I don't care if they use my data. So we need to know and we need to be careful about what people do. I mean, I'm not talking about deep fake and all these kinds of things because they, that really goes into the criminal part of it, but I'm going into normal use of everyday use, what it means. People try to understand how a cookies mean, so they, they kind of understand that, but we need to be more careful about educating people on how they use their phones, how they use applications, how they choose to use them, and that there are other ways. And then we can, because we, we divide it very, uh, very truthfully in how it is, privacy for private individuals and transparency for companies. Whereas with companies also, just briefly, we have the AI, the EU AI Act, where transparency is the magic word. Um, but we have to educate people and companies on how they have to use their data and, and give them to others. Uh, thank you so much, this is great and I'd like to keep it interactive, but I, I want to bring it back to the panelists and move on to the third section and that will finish up the flow that I had in mind. Thanks for bearing with me. And uh, then if we still have a few minutes, we'll come back and mix it all up. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's uh, get back to the original order. And the question now, uh, this will be the same question, now that we've discussed such wonderful things, both from your end as well as from the esteemed audience over here, um, uh, around digital cooperation, I, I want to hear, we would all like to hear from your, from your initiatives, from your company, from your roles, what is it that you are doing to advance this, this cause? How do you make the tie out, Sanjay? Yeah, thank you. So we all know that uh, you know, the, uh, digital and technology can help humanity by a big, by a, by, by a big way, right? We focused on the on the bad part for the most part of this panel today of privacy and 
and transparency, etc. Uh, but you know, in, in my panel when I prepared, you, I was looking at how uh, digital and technology can be a great benefit for the society, and some of the initiatives that my company and my employees, our employees, have done over the years. Uh, I think it's needless to say, you know, today technology is the equalizer. Uh, back in the day, it used to take years, <coughs> not decades, to, to build a company, a lot of investment, you know, a lot of money, a lot of effort to, to start a business and make it successful. Today, we know uh, all it takes is a garage uh, with a laptop and then access to internet to, to start companies. And we have seen plenty of those, right? Apple, Amazon, you know, Google, you name it, uh, have all started uh, with, right. with the Right, I just want you to make it like make it contextual and specific to kind of your company and your oh, service. Yeah. So I'm getting it right. Just, just give me a second. Uh, so while we while, while we know the importance, we have, uh, we as a company uh, decided there's so many uh, people, kids in India that don't have access to uh, to technology and digital. So we have we have taken this mission of uh, uh, computerizing uh, government and and not so well to do schools in India by providing uh, uh, com uh, computer labs to them and uh, using our people and our network teams to, to build these labs, right? <coughs> and we connected these labs to, to high-speed internet and we facilitated them with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with someone who can help the kids navigate the, navigate the goods of internet and using our technology team, we made sure they don't have access to any of the bags that uh, come with technology, right? So over the over the years, we have uh, digitized many schools uh, using our our uh, you know computers, our laptops, and our people, and this has helped. This is helping uh, schools and orphanages in India bridge the digital divide. To understand, that's, that's really really admirable work, Sanjay. Thanks for bringing uh, bringing that, and thanks for you know each of us moving the needle towards uh, towards these things. Uh, Emma, over to you. What specifically from your initiatives are helping move the needle? Our motto is that uh, everyone is an influencer. Uh, my mom's person recognizes uh, his uniqueness and knows how to share it and how to persuade others it becomes the influencer. And that one person becomes influencer, he has a social power. We offer those people the, uh, different ways how to monetize the social power in cooperation with brands and others. So uh, what we do now uh, in that context, we enable anyone to become the influencer of the new era, Web3 era. Uh, create his own influence network um, to shine in this digital revolution and uh, start earning uh, on the social power. And currently we are focused more on the under uh, like third world countries, let's call that. Uh, the big population, uh, Brazil, uh, India, Vietnam, and Asian countries, where uh, most of the people, by the way, those countries are very active in the Web3 and Metaverse, and uh, uh, so we didn't choose that by chance, uh, it was purposeful. So we think that uh, in the current, in the new era, technological era, uh, while becoming uh, the new technologies enable any person to become the leader, to become the influencer, and to become the, to educate others to transform into the new technology and, and build this career uh, on the base of uh, these trends. Thank you, man. Mikhail, from, uh, your, from your company, from your end, what is it specifically that is helping uh, uh, towards cooperation? Uh, uh, I'd like to talk about one important aspect. You know that uh, today one of the uh, most important trends is uh, the rapid development of artificial intelligence. And there are a lot of opportunities but a lot of threats linked with artificial intelligence. I think that the threat number one, in my opinion, is uh, that if artificial, uh, if all major solutions in politics, in uh, science in uh, business, etc., will be made by artificial intelligence if the human civilization will lose the meaning of the existence. And human being will lose the meaning of the sense of the existence. And that's why it's very important uh, to develop uh, both 
artificial intelligence and crowd intelligence or collective intelligence. Because crowd intelligence provides for human beings the opportunity uh, to uh, uh, confirm that they can impact on the important decisions of different companies or different organizations or different regions in different countries. Uh, so, um, as you know, it's the same uh, situation with the medicine. Sometimes you need to take two me medicine. One will give one effect, another will give another effect, and uh, will uh, help you to avoid side effect from the first medicine. So, uh, that's why my short conclusion is that artificial intelligence is the future of the humanity, but it will be a very dangerous future if we will not develop in parallel crowd intelligence. And we are trying to uh, play a role in this development. Okay. Um, <coughs> we, uh, in one of the programs that I did, we ingested one point over one million diamonds into the blockchain platform that I mentioned earlier and ran it against um, a AI-driven rule-based um, engine and model uh, which borrowed from the United Nations uh, guidelines that I mentioned and found out that 10% or something were rejected because they were blood diamonds, they were not compliant. Uh, that's one example of some of the work uh, that, you know, from my end, uh, we've been able to move the needle. Uh, we've also tried to apply, uh, some of you from Web3 might know the term, decentralized I identity or self-sovereign identity. And a few of us in COVID started figured out, you know, how is it that we can help? And we curated uh, and brought a bunch of ready, very ready demos and POCs in place on the use of uh, health passports, right? Uh, uh, the use of DID for health passports. Um, it's a tricky subject because it gets into the whole privacy aspect as well. Um, and. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a tricky subject, but also at the same time coming back to the standards, there are competing standards uh, from the Web3 side, it's being pushed by DID and many of you know those, that, that body of work that is happening. Uh, but there is also a competing, fairly competing ISO standard, which is not decentralized, nothing good or bad about that. I don't think decentralized, I personally don't think decentralization is about the topology, it's more about the governance structure. So the third example I wanted to leave with you is, um, it is where, where the notion of digital identity uh, is competing uh, in its implementation with other standards and the one in the US that has been adopted recently by Apple Wallet, right? Uh, I think something like 16 states in the United States have signed up to have driver's licenses digitally in Apple's wallet. And it did not adopt the DID self-sovereign working framework, it adopted a different, also global, a digital standard, uh, digital identity standard, I believe, from the ISO. Now, I'm not religious about which standard should be followed or not. I am religious about how we are serving societal purpose, and if we can accomplish the same outcomes through centralized versus decentralized, I'm uh, frankly, uh, I'm less agnostic to the underlying portion. So, I just wanted to interrupt over there, giving you, in all fairness, two, three of examples and other, uh, several others from how we've been able to move the needle a little bit from the digital labs uh, side. Uh, <clears throat> let me formally <laughs> open it up to the audience to take the last few minutes uh, of any brief uh, question or comments, please. Let me give her a chance and then I'll come to you. But let's be brief so everybody can get a turn. Uh, yep. My name is Yip, I'm the CEO of JEDI. We catalyze uh, human collaboration at global scale. My question to this very wonderful audience is, what is actually needed for those of you who shape the world in, in Web3 in terms of regulation for data sovereignty on the individual level? I have been wondering if, I guess we have a few blind spots at the moment in regulation that helps me own my own data in order then to monetize it. I think one of the panelists or a guest audience spoke about this right for informed consent. But if I can inform, if there's informed consent, then it should be possible for me to track and monetize on all the contributions that my consent is given to the companies 
I was wondering where in the web three world we are standing at the moment in terms of harmonizing these worlds of consent and monetization. Right? Thank you. Uh, Amadi, we will answer that. Yeah, can okay. I take that because this is a, a actually, brief, yeah. actually getting addressed in a panel tomorrow. Oh, yeah, yes. that's very good. You're all panel. Which panel? Which panel? Tell her that. Four o'clock. Web, web three and digital. In this room. In this room. <laughs> oh, yeah. we can just uh, we can yeah. just keep sitting there. Um, I just have a few closing remarks. Mel, uh, uh, you were going to say something, please. Very quick. Yes, I just wanted to say that we are working on such a technology as well to enable the decentralized cultures and uh, the collaboration uh, which you are all uh, striving to achieve. And so we are uh, developing a technology, it's hypercycle.ai, which enables uh, data to be cryptographically private by individuals and then it can be put in a pot like the but different than how it's uh, done now with the centralized databases. So uh, it can stay private as well as it can be uh, merged together and processed for enabling that uh, uh, collaborative intelligence. And just oh, thank you. Thank you. And I have um, many questions, but there's no time. Oh, we have a lot of time outside. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, just a brief closing remark, quick boom, 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 and then I have a few closing remarks and call for action straight away. Uh, well, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, session. One of the best. Uh, I uh, took part in many um, harassment events, and I think it's one of the most interesting sessions for many, many years. So kind. Thanks to the audience, and of course to yeah, the expert yeah. panel, uh, the three of you. Uh, Evan, Evan, uh, sorry, any, any closing remarks? Uh, uh, I also enjoy the, the, these days, especially food. Thank you all for participating. Very great pleasure being with you. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, thank, thank you for uh, uh, moderating this panel. I know you did it in the last minute. Uh, <laughs> we weren't supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> we saw the program. <laughs> but yeah, but thanks for the audience to, to actually, you know, I felt this is more panel for everyone than just the four of us here. Uh, so thanks for all the insightful uh, comments about it. Yeah, you know, I learned from a, from a great general of India, uh, his, his lessons on leadership, and he says, you always are nervous and you always are scared, but you never show fear. Uh, so that was to the point we didn't, we, we aren't supposed to, you know, that was a private thing. <laughs> so we never show our preparedness and we never show fear. We might be inside, so. Uh, I've got three points, right? I and I feel about them very passionately. That I would um, uh, craft these as kind of a call, of, call to action, but also anything that you can help me help yourself, help others around you. One is uh, the point I already made, which is around machines. We expect our machines to be more perfect than us. I don't think that's a wrong vision. I think that is a perfect vision. But I think, and I speak with the bias coming in as a trained computer scientist. Uh, I think we've got to find a way on how do we give a break. Uh, to the technologists and the computer science, many of you who are right here in the room and in this conference that are innovating for those purposes, right? It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be the perfect answer, but we never let, but we never let perfection come in the world, uh, in, the, in the way of the possible, right? We never let perfection come in the way of the possible, otherwise progress will just get paralyzed, right? The second point I will make is we suffer from uh, from a great difficulty, and that is we look at our current state of affairs. We look at, let me reference, we look at new possibilities from technology, from an old set of lenses. Right? We are reimagining the future world with this digital technology from an old set of glasses. We are looking at new forms of cryptocurrency, crypto tokens, digital assets, from old forms of security laws. When I run the hackathon for them, uh, from, from a German, from, for a German OEM, uh, <clears throat> we came up with a, a hack for incentive-based mechanism for traffic decongestion at intersections. That's a mouthful. Incentive-based mechanisms for decongesting traffic intersections. Why can't any vehicle become an emergency vehicle 
with the right incentive structures. But we cannot have those incentives, we cannot negotiate those incentive structures with other cars at that intersection with current instruments of currency because they are friction loaded and they can't work at the speed of the internet. They can't work at the speed of the internet. So we have to invent new instruments of incentives to make those new reimagined scenarios possible. Um, what I will also say <coughs> towards a more broader uh, uh, articulation of the same point is that we can't look at things in a binary manner, just like the discussion on privacy, either you have it or you don't. Either you sign off the updated terms of condition or you stop using your cell phone or your app. We have to get to more granular uh, levels and this is the area of digital public goods. I don't think privacy is a you have it or you don't have it. It is a more granular thing that you negotiate it. And one of the things that the internet and these technologies have done wonderfully is matchmaking. Uber wouldn't be possible without these kind of technologies being there today. And it's a very fast matchmaking machine, right? How do we match and negotiate incentive mechanisms for things that I'm willing to give us so much privacy in exchange for this much value. And we have to get it away from a binary set of old lenses into a new set of uh, perspective and lenses, and that is, has to be more granular. But to get it to granular, you have to have the machine and the engines to be able to negotiate those things very, very rapidly, very, very dynamically. And so those are the three things that I personally feel very passionate about. And I would invite you into some of the discussion that causes uh, you know, into the combined with what you are doing or some of the things that I will, I'm doing. Uh, and thank you once again, Kyle, uh, Emmett, and Sanjay uh, for such an esteemed panel. Uh, you guys had great preparation, even though I was a little bit lax on my preparation in the last minute. Thank you so much. Please give them a hand. One, two, three. Great group. One more. Well, perfect. One more, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Do not move.